The following program deals with a controversial subject. The theories expressed are not the only possible interpretation. Viewers are invited to make a judgment based on all available information. This program contains images which may be disturbing to younger or sensitive viewers. Parental discretion is advised. Tonight on In Search Of. Hell. Many believe it's a place filled with fire, pain, and eternal suffering. We'll meet a man who claims he's been to hell and back. Vampires have long been the subject of legend and myth. The attraction of a vampire is the power. A vampire does not answer to others. But there's startling new evidence that these creatures of the night may be lurking among us today. Yes, I have taste of blood. Interesting taste, but you gotta be very careful about it. Half a million volts are running through this woman's body. Could that same power charge a top secret weapon? We'll search for the Tesla death ray. Does a monster dwell beneath the surface of this beautiful lake? Actual home video may support that claim. We have 500 known witnesses so far, but we know that there might be maybe 2,000 in total, because all of them have not dared to come out with what they've seen. The mystery begins in Sweden, as we go in search of lake monsters. I'm Mitch Pileggi, and this is In Search Of. It's another world of evil and anguish, where lost souls are punished for eternity. This is the image that's been created by myth and religion. But many believe that hell's a real place. You are about to meet a man who claims that he's actually seen the flames of hell and lived to tell about it. Join us now in search of hell. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? Oh God, the words my of God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Oh my God, I why are you so far from delivering them? To you they cry. And they're pushing and pulling, and then they start scratching, and then sort of clawing, and then biting. Hell is the most horrible, horrific state of existence any soul can imagine, and it goes on eternally. It seemed the more I screamed in pain, the happier they became. For thousands of years, prophets, poets, and religious zealots have described a place of unimaginable horror, an eternity of unrelenting punishment for the damned, the evil underworld of hell. In some beliefs, it's a terrible place of torture and pain and agony. In other beliefs, it's a sort of a stopping point as a place where a spirit goes to purge its evil before coming to a new life. And in some beliefs, hell is a, a temporary place where a soul is tortured for a certain amount of time and then is annihilated. The soul ceases to exist. The image of hell was influenced by the religious concept of God's retribution. Hell is a place for divine justice. You could escape justice in the world, but you could not escape justice in the afterlife. And souls consigned to hell were consigned there directly because of their own sins, their own evil deeds. And you could not hide your deeds in the afterlife. The Inferno by medieval poet Dante Alighieri depicts hell as a tunnel boring downward. As you descend, you get down into the worst sins, murder, heresy, uh, usury at the very base of hell was Lucifer and he was a three-headed monster uh, sort of a like a, a horrible mutated bird and in the beaks of this bird he would be gnawing on the uh, betrayers the great betrayers of history whatever hell represents no one has actually witnessed its horror and returned to talk about it 
until now. Howard Storm, a college art professor at Northern Kentucky University, had no preconceived beliefs in heaven or hell. He was a staunch atheist. The here and now was all that mattered to Howard. My hope was to become a famous artist, and that's my whole that's what my whole life was designed around, to achieve fame and um, fortune. Everybody was either um, a factor in me getting my way, or they were a hindrance to me getting my way, and I treated people accordingly. All that would change for Howard when he took a trip to Paris in 1985. He was rushed to a hospital with a perforated stomach wall. Howard had only hours to live. I said to my wife, I said, it's time for us to say goodbye. I'm not gonna make it now. When I stopped breathing and just let death come, I knew with 100% certainty that that meant the end of living and that, that meant the end of consciousness, that meant the end of me. But what happened to Howard next was more terrifying than death itself. He woke up and found himself standing in his room. Although Howard tried to speak to his wife, she ignored him. Then Howard noticed something even more puzzling. Someone was lying in his bed. And as I examined it more carefully, I was horrified and surprised that it looked just like me. But I knew it couldn't be me because I was, from my point of view, awake, alive. Through the open doorway, Howard noticed medical staff out in the hall calling him. Not sure of what to do, he finally left the hospital room to follow what he thought were nurses that would take him to surgery. Howard, we've been waiting for you. With each step, they became more hideous and threatening. Howard walked for what seemed an eternity. Finally, like vultures waiting for their prey to weaken, his demonic escorts turned on him. people all over me, gnawing and clawing at me. I remember my ears being ripped off, and I remember sharp fingernails in my eyes and in the orifices of my body, trying to get inside of me. With all of his strength, Howard tried to fight the creatures off, but he was overwhelmed. It seemed the more I screamed in pain, the happier they became. And I was also aware that there were a lot of people now, dozens, hundreds, thousands, I don't know, but the noise level was absolutely deafening. No human being has ever imagined how awful that place is and the things that they can do to inflict humiliation and pain on you. Finally, Howard collapsed into the crowd of bloodthirsty savages. I heard myself, I heard my voice say, pray to God. And I thought, what a stupid idea, I don't believe in God. Desperately searching for help, Howard blurted out anything with the word God in it. People around me were horrified at the things that I was saying. And it was as if I was scalding them with live steam or something. Each time the demons heard the word, they screamed in terror. God! And retreated into the darkness. I was left alone, totally broken, and ripped up, unable to go anywhere, hardly able to move at all. And instead of my life being over, I had um, been taken on this descent into this place. I believed that I was in this place for an eternity. Completely shattered, Howard lay in the bleak emptiness with no sense of time and space. I thought about my life and what a failure I'd been because I hadn't been a good husband, I hadn't been a good father, I hadn't been a good son. I knew that there was um, an inevitability and a rightness to ending up there. Suddenly, Howard noticed a tiny speck of light that grew larger as it sped toward him. And hands reached down and lifted me up into this light. And as I was being picked up, for the first time in this darkness, I saw myself and I looked like roadkill. As these hands were picking me up, all that stuff started disappearing and everything came back together. And, and more importantly, on the inside, I was in abject despair. And as I was being picked up, that was turned into 
an ecstasy that um, I live every moment of my life to recapture that someday. <laughs> an ecstasy beyond description. Howard's rescue from hell into this heavenly world transformed him. I felt so ashamed. I felt like I was such a bad person, so undeserving of these feelings of love and goodness that I was getting. In an instant, Howard was back in his hospital bed. When he opened his eyes, he was on his way to surgery. Howard's physical recovery took over a year. His emotional recovery took much longer. There was definitely elements in there that, that he can't even describe to this day without breaking down in tears. And that's, that's the most affecting part of his, of his experience for me. I don't think that the things that he saw can be fabricated by, by just an overactive imagination. Howard Storm's terrifying journey led him to a new understanding of what hell is. If we are cruel, manipulative, we're going to experience the pain and the cruelty that we have imposed upon others. We're going to experience that. Dr. Barbara Romer offers a scientific explanation for Storm's experience. The medical community would typically say that the near-death experience is a physiologic episode, that it is not spiritual, that it occurs secondary to anoxia, which is low blood oxygen, possibly to a hallucination, to dissociation, to blocking of receptor sites in the brain, or to endorphins. But Dr. Romer is not sure that medical theory applies to Howard Storm what speaks for the validity of these experiences as being true experiences is the significant clarity of thought and the very vivid memory. I know of no dream, hallucination, delusion, chemical reaction, anoxic reaction, endorphin reaction, which will cause these permanent profound changes. Whether hell is a real place, a religious belief, or some scenario we conjure in death according to what we believe in life, it remains a horrifying vision of unearthly terror. Howard Storm's personal experience may be the only proof that anyone in search of hell will ever find. Coming up, a high-voltage killing machine kept secret for decades. And what danger lurks beneath the surface of this quiet lake? Just in here and saw the, the serpent diving into the lake. I felt the hair rise in my neck. But first, as a new generation of vampires roaming the night, we'll see how they quench their thirst or human blood. Vampire. The brooding gothic bloodsucker is a popular figure in television, film, and books. But have romantic notions of the vampire allowed it to leap from folklore into the modern world? Some terrifying events suggest that a new breed of vampire is on the loose. The vampire's fanged kiss promises eternal life and a seductive essence that irresistibly leads to sexual conquest. It's an erotic dance, a ballet of blood, luring us to the dark side. We feel safe knowing that this monster is only imaginary. But here's the shocking truth. Vampires have clawed their way out of legend and history, leaping straight into the real world. Today, all across the United States and parts of Europe, modern day vampires are emerging from the shadows. These night crawlers embrace the world of the vampire as an alternative lifestyle, complete with gothic attire, seductive kissing, and in some cases, a genuine lust for blood. Yes, I have tasted blood. Um, matter of fact, tonight. 
Interesting taste, but you got to be very careful about it. Jason Ganella sees no conflict between the vampire lifestyle and his job with the United States military. The attraction of a vampire is the power. A vampire, whether it be real or mythological, does not answer to others. Artist Sherry Espagnati is attracted to something else. What's so fascinating about being a vampire that is it's a forbidden fruit, it's a taboo, it's exotic, and it's mystical. Kalila Smith, author and historian, has studied the phenomena extensively. The vampires come from all walks of life. Oftentimes it's runaways. Other times it's people who have very, very ordinary jobs. Could be your neighbor, your banker, your child's teacher. And um, at night, in the secrets of their homes, they actually drink blood. It's only a small percentage, though, that would actually resort to violence or murder to obtain this blood. For these night stalkers, living the vampire lifestyle in public is liberating and enticing. But some have crossed over into the dark side, leaving death in their wake. After leading his followers in a blood-drinking ritual, vampire cult leader Rod Farrell joined in the brutal murder of his friend's parents. In 1998, Joshua Ruddig, who claimed to be a blood-drinking vampire, slashed the throats of four people in San Francisco. One of them died. But if vampirism is defined by a thirst for blood, Rudiger and Farrell pale in comparison to Vlad Dracula. The 16th century Transylvanian prince executed 40,000 men, women, and children by impaling them on wooden stakes. It is said that he enjoyed drinking the blood of his victims while dining amid their corpses. He was nicknamed Vlad Sepish, or Vlad the Impaler. Using the historical Vlad Sepish as his inspiration, Bram Stoker published the novel Dracula in the late 19th century. In a bizarre twist, Vlad Dracula also inspired this man to adopt his name and the Impaler's thirst for blood. New Orleans resident Vlad Sepish Knight actually believes that he's a modern day vampire. We don't live in the same bodies for hundreds of thousands of years. We do eventually die. We just age slower, heal a lot faster, are less susceptible to disease. And we do need to drink blood. In choosing his prey, Vlad Sepish Knight uses the vampire's legendary powers of seduction. It's willing people. I don't go around attacking people. Mainly my preference is the ladies. There are people that prefer males as well. It's an erotic feeling because a lot of ladies enjoy it. A lot of times I will possibly bite them and draw from the skin. I don't leave puncture marks. In fact, less than what you give a blood bank. So there's really no after effects on them other than a little bit of ecstasy on their side. The compulsion to drink blood and the vampire's fearsome appearance may have a medical explanation. It is a disease called porphyria. A person with porphyria has some sort of deficiency in the blood that creates a condition where the gums start receding, so it looks as if they're developing fangs. The skin becomes very, very fragile and very thin. They have sensitivity to light in the eyes and the skin. Eventually, mental derangement takes over, and these people may attack someone. Vlad Sepish Knight does not have porphyria, though he does display many of its symptoms. When I don't feed, I get sick, okay? I get a little bit sickly, I get less energetic. I find that it's, I'm a lot less tolerant of sunlight. Um, I'm a lot less tolerant of people. When these people did replace what was missing in their blood by possibly drinking the blood of others, that the symptoms sort of subsided. Many modern day vampires have engineered a legal way to get their precious life-giving fluid by forming sacred feeding circles. Vampire expert Catherine Ramslin has studied the dynamics of this disturbing relationship. Within the vampire culture, there are people who consider themselves donors. 
and they tend to be more submissive. They're looking for some more powerful person to overwhelm them and they want to surrender to that. They want the blood to be taken from them. So they want to be the ones the vampire goes to. Despite the obvious health risks of drinking human blood, the modern vampire's kiss is rarely lethal. But vampire experts warn of a new menace on the horizon. They claim that this breed of monster uses psychic force to drain the life from your body. There are others who call themselves psychic vampires who are not drinking blood, but who are taking your life essence. Usually with a blood drinker, there's always some sort of prearranged consent there. With the psychic vampires, what makes them so dangerous is that the victims usually don't know that it's going on. These people have mastered taking energy from other people. They can pull that energy right through the eyes of the victim. It can make the person very tired. It can damage the immune system. Eventually, the person gets sick. The person could even die. Insatiable blood drinkers, nocturnal club denizens, and psychic parasites. Are they victims of their own fascination with vampires, or are they actually members of the same sinister species? The truth remains shrouded, but be forewarned. In the search for vampires, the hunter may become the hunted. Later, on In Search Of. Think sea monsters are nothing but a myth? Then you haven't been to this Swedish lake. But first, was a powerful death ray secretly invented nearly a century ago? The electrifying facts, next on In Search Of. Imagine the power of lightning at your fingertips. Now channel four million volts of electricity through the barrel of a gun, and you've built a death ray. That unstoppable superweapon may no longer belong to the realm of science fiction. Experts say that a working ray gun was developed decades ago. If so, who controls this lethal secret today? Let's begin the search for Tesla's death ray. A powerful weapon that could strike like lightning, annihilating anything in its path. Ray guns have powered science fiction for a century. If only there were more power! Evidence now suggests that the death ray is more fact than fiction. And recently released footage stands as chilling proof that yesterday's fantasy is today's weapon of war. A Serbian immigrant by the name of Nikola Tesla was considered to be one of the great scientific minds of all time. In the 1930s, he allegedly designed a working death ray. Tesla's definition of a death ray was the ability to have a generator that would produce a very large electrical charge and then to be able to aim that, much like a flashlight or a laser light beam, to a distant target, thus destroying or disabling the opposing force. The search for the death ray begins mysteriously inside a New York hotel where Nikola Tesla lived for nine years. Tesla had fallen on hard times, and the hotel accepted whatever he had placed in storage as collateral for unpaid bills. Some believe that this included a miniature prototype of his death ray. For over 60 years, Tesla had made brilliant contributions to modern science. Without Nikola Tesla, we would not have alternating current. We would not have television. We would not have radio. In 1893, Tesla's alternating current made it possible to safely transmit electricity across great distances. His genius paved the way to light the world. Tesla even harnessed the power of lightning with his invention of the Tesla coil. 
A Tesla coil is used in practically every electronic device you can name. Your TV set, your radios, all have Tesla coils because they all require high voltage electricity. The Tesla coil ionizes the air and can be used to create a spectacular display. But one miscalculation can be fatal. With half a million volts, enough to power 250 deadly electric chairs, the Tesla coil is a very dangerous platform. Nightclub entertainer Cinder Moon puts her life on the line with every performance. When I do my show, I get soaking wet and I stand on top of uh, the Tesla coil, which will run 500,000 volts of electricity through my body. When lightning is coming out of my fingertips, it does create burns on the end of my fingertips. If I were to get too close to something, I would ground, which could cause a surge of electricity to go through my body, thus resulting in a heart attack. I've had electricians come in and see my show and get deathly petrified and run to the back of the club thinking that I'm going to electrocute myself. It was the man-made lightning produced by the Tesla coil that inspired the death ray. An accelerator that could transmit a tightly focused beam of charged electron particles. Anything in its path would be obliterated. At a press conference, Tesla announced his latest invention, a death beam capable of destroying 10,000 planes from 250 miles away. Tesla offered his death ray to American military leaders in 1940. The official story is that they had no interest in the weapon. Three years later, Nikola Tesla died at the age of 86. Immediately after his death, Tesla's documents and notebooks, engineering notebooks, were confiscated by the United States government by the Bureau of Alien Affairs and held there until after the war. Experts believe that the FBI opened the locker containing Tesla's miniature prototype. What they found inside has never been revealed. Where has it gone to in the world today? Why was it not accounted for in anybody's inventory? That's like asking whatever happened to the Ark of the Covenant. Nobody's talking about it. The FBI may have seized Tesla's prototype, but many believe the research papers for the weapon fell into foreign hands. There was evidence to indicate that the Soviet Union did look over his papers to find out if there was anything of military significance. Some believe that Soviet leaders may have ordered development of Tesla's death ray to counter America's early lead in nuclear arms. In 1960, U-2 pilot Francis Gary Powers was flying well above Soviet surface-to-air missile range when he saw a bright flash and lost all control of his spy plane. Some claim he fell victim to a Soviet version of Tesla's death ray. Additional evidence emerged in the 1970s. It's considered proprietary, it's considered government secret, but there are aerial reconnaissance photographs of facilities that were taken over Russia that bear out the possibility that they were working on Tesla technology and advancing his ideas. And in fact, it was speculated that they developed a death ray weapon there. Was the Soviet Union armed with Tesla's death ray? When we come back, the United States plays catch up and shocking video taken from the space shuttle seems to reveal a death ray in action. The target, a UFO. This program contains images which may be disturbing to younger or sensitive viewers. Parental discretion is advised. The search continues for a mysterious device commonly referred to as Tesla's death ray. 
a particle beam weapon that could sow destruction at the speed of light. Many believe that the Soviet Union used the pioneering work of scientific genius Nikola Tesla to develop a deadly ray gun. But two can play that game, and the United States forged ahead with its own death ray program. The research work done under the Star Wars Strategic Initiative, or SDI as we know it, followed the idea of a coherent beam of charged particles with a high voltage source as the power supply being able to strike a distant remote target. That's the very concept of Tesla's so-called death ray. Such a weapon could obliterate aircraft and missiles and blast satellites out of orbit, all in the blink of an eye. The Cold War is over, but that hasn't stopped the death ray arms race. The United States holds the edge. This gleaming 747 is the first in a fleet of U.S. Air Force jets to be fitted with a swiveling nose cone laser, capable of destroying enemy missiles hundreds of miles away. And this is THEL, the tactical high energy laser. This ground-based laser sends a beam whose core temperature is greater than the surface of the sun. Recently released footage serves as dramatic evidence that the Star Wars program has moved off the drawing board and onto the battlefield. Thel demonstrates its destructive power as the laser destroys two incoming missiles. With this one test, Nikola Tesla's plan for a death ray has become frighteningly real. There are plans to place a similar system in outer space. But will an orbiting death ray target missiles launched from Earth or a hostile spacecraft from another world? This shocking video of a live NASA transmission may hold the answer. Taken from the space shuttle, it appears to show an unidentified flying object hovering far above the Earth. Suddenly, the UFO takes evasive action, dodging what appears to be a bolt of energy fired from the Earth. Could the Tesla death ray already be part of Earth's defense against invasion? Controversy still rages over the content of this video. NASA calls it an optical illusion. But UFO experts claim that it's proof of an Earth-based ray gun system. Laser cannons, charged particle beams, electromagnetic guns. Modern weapons that deliver lethal force at the speed of light, powered by fear, imagination, and the high voltage genius of Nikola Tesla, inventor of the death ray. Imagine a quiet day on the lake when suddenly a 20-foot monster swims across your path. It happened to this woman, and she caught it on tape. Next. Sea monsters, lake creatures. Huge scaly beasts forgotten by time and evolution lurking in the murky darkness. If these sound like mere campfire legends, don't tell that to locals near two Scandinavian lakes where sudden attacks have terrified generations of swimmers and boaters. Now, a rare videotape offers chilling evidence that may keep you on dry land for good. Lake Stuhuan, Sweden. This woman is on holiday, laughing, smiling, and about to videotape a rare and shocking sight, an encounter with a sea serpent. Was it a monster of the deep? On the same lake, this man claims to have been attacked, his boat overturned and hurled into the sky by the angry whipping tail of a 20-foot sea creature. Was this vicious perpetrator the great Swedish lake monster known as Stussy? 
Legends about menacing sea serpents have staked their dark and foreboding claim inside the human heart since man first began to record his fears. Lake Stuklin in the mountains of northern Sweden is home to Stusi, a creature recognized and feared for over 400 years. Ann Odstein is a local historian. We have 500 known witnesses so far, but we know that there might be maybe 2,000 in total, because all of them have not dared to come out with what they've seen. While some locals believe in her existence, others contend that she is pure fiction. But for some, no proof is necessary. They claim to have tangled with the Swedish monster. Ragnar Björks is an administrator with the Jamtlands Fisheries Department. One day while checking fishing permits on Lake Stuhuen, he had the fright of his life. The lake was very calm when suddenly a huge tail broke through the surface right beside his rowboat. Bjork struck at the monster with his oar, hitting it on the back. Its tail struck back and flipped the rowboat 10 feet in the air. Bjorks was able to escape and return to shore. He never believed in the lake monster, but after this violent encounter, Ragnar Bjorks knows that danger lurks below Lake Stuhuen. Could this serene lake be the home of a sea monster? Are the eyewitness accounts to be believed? The first thing I saw were the humps. There were five or six of them about 30 feet away. Gunbrit Widmark, along with 20 other senior citizens, was vacationing aboard the steamship Tumi. They had spotted a series of humps connected to a lizard-like head that had emerged from the lake. I wish I had turned my video camera on earlier, but I was very frightened. I tried to capture the image of the animal's head, but by the time I reached it, the creature had submerged. I know what I saw that day, and I will never forget it. Others have said that uh, when the monster shows itself, it is a sign of bad times. Ulla Oskarsson is with the Japlands Lands Museum. Her job is to preserve the historical record of Stusi. Oskarsson's research uncovered a story about Stusi's origin that suggests she is a magical creature come to life. Legend has it that in ancient times, two magicians concocted a brew that boiled for years and years. One day, the water began to churn and heave violently, when all of a sudden there was a loud noise and a monster erupted and burst forth. Horrified by what they had unleashed, the magicians cast a spell to keep the serpent bound. They carved a secret code into a rune stone. As long as the code remained a mystery, the serpent would be bound. People managed to solve the mystery of, of the, the rune letters in the late 19th century. And that was the time when a lot of observations were happening in the lake here. There were so many sightings in the late 19th century that the town commissioned a trap to be built. It was designed to capture and kill the beast. It was made 1894. You, you open it up and you had uh, some bait in here. And uh, as soon as something touches it, it goes together and, and uh, capture the animal that is in it. This iron monster catcher stands as a reminder that in the decade prior to the dawn of the 20th century, there was an explosion of sightings. The amount has never been duplicated until our time. But Stussy is not alone. There is more than one Scandinavian Leviathan. And when we come back, a monster hunter attempts a new technique to prove the existence of these mysterious creatures. Could this be the first ever recording of a lake monster? For 
centuries, there have been reports of terrifying encounters with enormous sea creatures in the lake regions of Scandinavia. Recent video evidence of Sweden's legendary lake monster, Stussy, indicates that something unusual and unexplainable lurks beneath these calm waters. At Lake Seljutsvatnet, located in Norway, eyewitnesses describe another mysterious sea serpent. It is said to be 40 feet long with a horse-shaped head that rises above the water as it swims. Her name is Selma. Erik Engsutter is a highly respected boat captain on Lake Seljutsvatnet. He has been reluctant to share his observations until now. At this moment, we are at the place where I had my first observation. Just in here, I saw the, the serpent diving into the lake. I felt the hair rise in my neck. I didn't dare to tell anybody about that. Researcher Jan Uwe Sundby has dedicated his life to hunting the elusive Selma. Today, he begins a new investigation. He will try to track his underwater nemesis with a hydrophone, an underwater listening device on loan from the Swedish Navy. You have to be here over a certain period of time, everything from a week to two weeks, and then you have to listen regularly. After days of patient listening, Sunbai's hydrophone picks up a frightening sound from the watery depths. Could this be the first ever recording of a sea monster? The mystery of the Norwegian lake monsters continues to deepen. Recently, Lake Stukwin, the alleged lair of Stusi, has been the location of another sighting. Aelin and Cecilia Hemrius are cousins, and they live near Lake Stuhuen. While on summer break, the girls decided to go for a swim in the legendary lake. A few moments into their swim, Cecilia noticed a slow-moving hump in the distance. She alerted her cousin, and both girls froze in horror. 20 yards ahead of them was the sea serpent. The young girls frantically swam back to shore. The behemoth dipped in and out of the water three times and then vanished. Together, Aelin and Cecilia created a sculptured replica of what they had seen on that fateful night. They also made drawings of Stussy's humps, her body and her long neck and head. These two pre-teenagers survived to report one of the closest and most chilling encounters yet with a great lake monster. Selma, Stussy. Are they the descendants of ancient sea predators? Are they a projection of the darkness inside all of us? Or are they magical creatures from a realm normally hidden from our five senses? Only one thing is certain. Something in these waters has frightened and enthralled people for hundreds of years. I believe there is a lake monster, and not until they've emptied the lake from all of its water, and I've actually seen that there is nothing there, then I believe it isn't there. Thanks for watching In Search Of. I'm Mitch Pileggi. Good night. The following program deals with a controversial subject. The theories expressed are not the only possible interpretation. Viewers are invited to make a judgment based on all available information. This program contains images which may be disturbing to younger or sensitive viewers. Parental discretion is advised. Tonight on In Search Of.
A beautiful woman casts an evil spell. An innocent girl plays games with the occult. Will each fall victim to the deadly hazards of witchcraft? And in Africa, a pair of lions terrorize and devour human prey. We'll go in search of the mysterious man-eaters of Savo. Are we secretly at war with aliens from another world? Some say the invasion of Earth has already begun, and this man claims he was taken prisoner. Do ghostly hitchhikers stalk our roadways? The stranger in your headlights may be stranger than anything you ever imagined. I'm Mitch Pileggi, and this is In Search Of. Witchcraft is a mystic practice that some see as a spiritual awakening, while others view it as a sinister portal to the occult. Even for those who just dabble in sorcery, the price of admission can be more than they ever bargained for. When good spells go bad, there may be hell to pay. Witchcraft is an ancient practice, the belief that a person can manipulate nature and destiny by casting a magic spell. But there may be a terrible price to pay. Spells can go one way or the other, you know, depending on the timing of the working, the reason for the working, the result that they want. Circle, circle, circling bright. Cast this circle in love and light. Some witches practice a nature-based religion called Wicca. Vision and sight. They worship ancient pagan deities and perform rituals that celebrate the seasons and the phases of the moon. This is rare footage of an actual ceremony. I call upon the spirits of air. The spirit of fire. Spirit of water. Guardians of the north. Come and be with us on this right. So mote it be. So mote it be. But there are other witches who practice darker arts. There's white witchcraft and there's black witchcraft. Usually the black witchcraft is for power or greed. Catherine Brooks used to practice black magic. Black witchcraft is so much more inviting because you get quick gratification. Usually, you find that the witches that get into the most trouble are usually the black witches. The year after I did this one money spell, the, the year to the date, my car got broken into and I had all my stuff stolen from me. It's never happened to me. Tradition has it that once the dark forces have been unleashed, even experts at black witchcraft can't escape the consequences. There was a girl that they called Cat because she was one of the darkest witches and most powerful. She could do spells and have them come true within an hour. According to Catherine Brooks, Cat had her eye on an apartment in the French Quarter of New Orleans, but someone already lived there, an elderly man whose wife had died the year before. She started doing spells to get the tenant out of there. I think it only took her two weeks to do the magic. She got this man put into a home by doing a certain kind of magic that can make someone go crazy. She moved into the apartment like 40 days later. But Kat didn't live in her new home for long. Three months after she moved into the apartment, they found her dead in her bed. When they did the autopsy, they said that it was foul play, that she was strangled. 
The thing was is that there was no imprintions or anything. It is alleged that the police officers who investigated Kat's death stumbled upon an important clue. Kat had kept a journal of all the spells that she did a week before the accident happened. She used a Ouija board to communicate with spirits. And she had written in this journal that there was a really strong spirit inside of there that she was trying to exercise out of it, but she couldn't. It seems that Kat had discovered that the old man hadn't been the only resident of the apartment. The spirit of his wife was staying in there with the husband. And so Kat evicted this man into a home and really pissed off this wife. According to Catherine Brooks, Kat's journal states that the wife's spirit came to her at night to strike fear into her dark heart. While she was sleeping, she felt the spirit above her, and she would wake up, and she would feel this pressure on her. The day before that she was killed, she had made a journal entry saying that she had felt like the spirit was so heavy on her that it felt like it was choking her. Police ignored the journal entries, and Kat's death officially remains an unsolved murder. But to those who knew her, what happened is no mystery. <laughs> it's a laughing joke at the witcher's corner that she was killed by that spirit because she had done such the hard the hardest black magic that you can do she just inflicted so much pain on him that his mate just came back and killed her according to witch raven monani Witchcraft is so complex and powerful that even benign spells cast by accomplished witchcrafters can still go tragically wrong. And the threefold law of casting spells also makes it much more dangerous. Anything you do, whether it be good or bad, it will come back to you three times. So that if you were to do something bad to someone, you would be paid back three times worse than what you did. The more adept you are at magic or spell work, the higher the price to pay. I've seen some witches do love spells and have gotten raped, and I mean, it's just, you don't want to mess with it. Stories abound of witches who regret using their craft to find love. I lived in a building that was like 90% witches, and uh, one of the girls was doing a love spell. She had done the spell over, you know, three days for this particular guy. Shortly after completing the ritual, the young woman's ordeal began. Six days after the last day of doing the spell, she started getting these phone calls. And she didn't know who it was. The calls increased and became more disturbing. The guy would call and make comments about her, or how she looked, or that he wanted to have sex with her, and all these things. Stop calling me. The young witch realized that her spell had worked, but not on the man she wanted. She knew that it was a stranger, just someone, you know, off the street. Her every moment was fraught with fear. Did the stalker know where she lived? Was he lurking in the shadows, watching? It got to the point where she had to call the police, and she ended up having to move out of the complex. For the inexperienced, working with the powers of witchcraft can be disastrous, even without casting a spell. One website report offers this classic case of witchcraft in the wrong hands. The alleged tragedy began when Sarah and her friends gathered for what was supposed to be a harmless afternoon of fun. Concentrate, everybody. One of the teenagers had found an old witch board and they wanted to try it out. Little did they realize what malevolent forces they were unleashing. For according to serious practitioners, a witch board is not a toy. It's a portal for huge evil. The kids giggled and teased each other as one by one, they asked the oracle a question. Finally, it was Sarah's turn. OK, next question. What is in mind your future? Right. Something good, something good. Something good. D. 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 It could be dollars. Dollars. Deals. Come on. 
D O. Oh. You're not moving it, right, guys? Mm -mm. Oh. No. No. Okay. E. D E. A. A. The communicator spelled out dead. Then stopped. The terrified teenager quit the game while her friends sought a harmless explanation. They didn't get one. Instead, the communicator spelled out accident. The next day, Sarah went out for her morning jog, possibly trying to put the witchboard experience out of her mind. She heard a sound behind her. The young girl died at the scene. Witchboards, incantations, strange rituals. It is said that witchcraft is not a game. The line between white and black magic is very thin and very easy to cross. If the passage of time has not diminished the power of this ancient practice, the question remains, do those who practice witchcraft control destiny? Some say they are only tempting fate. Coming up, are aliens using humans as laboratory specimens? And this man found himself on a collision course with an angry ghost. But first, a bloodthirsty rampage by two savage lions in search of human prey. A hunger for human flesh triggers one of the most savage killing sprees on record. Before it ends, nearly 140 men fall prey to the jaws of two murderous lions. Over a century later, experts still struggle for explanations. The trail of blood leads us to the jungle of East Africa in search of the man-eaters of Sabo. the jungle is kill or be killed, and this is the reigning predator. The king of African wildlife is rarely a match for modern weapons, or the relentless stampede of man-made machines. While they pose only a small threat to humans, there have been rare incidents of lions attacking people. But nothing compares to two rogue beasts that developed a savage taste for human flesh. They were the man-eaters of Sabo, and they went on a killing spree that has never been duplicated. What caused the lions to become man-eaters unlike anything Africa has ever seen? To find out, we travel to the heart of the dark continent. Sabo, the very name means place of slaughter. The two lions that once prowled the plains of this tiny region of Kenya held its people in a reign of terror and halted the construction of a railroad. In 1898, under the leadership of John Patterson, hundreds of Indian workers were brought to Kenya to build a railroad across the country. Shortly after construction started, workers began to disappear in the middle of the night. Soon it was discovered that two rogue lions were responsible. Lions usually have some bit of fear of man, but uh, these were just brazen. They would just go into these, these workers' tents at night and just drag them out uh, without a worry in the world. This unnatural lack of fear led many to believe the lions were evil spirits, called forth by native shaman to slay a monster they called the Iron Snake. The railroad would have been built many, many months earlier if it hadn't been for the lions. At one point, they absolutely paralyzed operations for, for three weeks when they were coming in and taking a man every night, absolutely. The workmen said, hey, forget it. You know, we're not going to work. They went out, you know, they built massive protections. Everybody's survival instinct was at play there. The African name for these killers was Shetani, which means devils of the night. And it was very easy for people to convert lions that nobody could kill 
that at random could kill whomever they wanted into some sort of mythical creature. Supernatural or not, the man-eaters of Savo seemed unstoppable. The Zabo workmen used to barricade themselves behind thorn bomas, these walls of uh, acacia thorn with two-inch thorns attached to every branch. The lions were so persistent in their attempts to attack the workmen, they'd force their way through these bomas and drag people out through the bomas themselves. Sometimes they would just pick them up in their jaws, jump over the thorn bush fence, and then proceed to eat the poor unfortunate right outside, which for his fellows back inside the bomas would listen to the crunching of the bones and think, is he going to come back? No, I'm safe tonight. But they would still have to listen to their comrade being devoured. They combined amazing strength with the unseen stealth of a ghost as they strolled into camp and killed at their leisure. It's, it's amazing to think that a lion could transport with no difficulty at all, a 150 or 180 pound man. But uh, uh, the fact of the matter is lions routinely drag zebras and buffalo uh, some distance. John Patterson took it upon himself to stop the possessed lions. Patterson stinted no effort in uh, staking himself out, spending all night sitting in a small tree over uh, the carcass of a donkey, trying to lure the, the lions, calling them to places. And each day, his journal just cries of frustration that he's in a tree on this side of the river. Meanwhile, uh, he hears the next morning that there's been an attack on the other side, and two more workmen have disappeared, and so on. This went on day after day, month after month. The uncanny ability of these lions to avoid their hunter defied explanation. It was as if they could read Patterson's mind. It was events like this that led everyone associated with these lions to see them as something uh, far more than just lions, but really supernatural terrors of the night. Finally, after almost eight months, Patterson was in the right place at the right time and almost became the next victim. After he had found an area where he thought it was likely that the lion would come back, he decided to set up all night for the lion. And rather than a tree, he constructed a, a blind and a hide for himself made out of a, a camp bed litter up on the top of 10-foot of poles. He thought that this would make him safe, but matters quickly took an unexpected turn. Suddenly, the hunter became the hunted. John Patterson wrote, and instead of making off or coming for the bait prepared for him, the lion began to stalk me. For about two hours, he horrified me by slowly creeping around and around my crazy structure, gradually edging his way nearer and nearer. If one of the flimsy poles should break, or if the lion could spring the 12 feet which separated me from the ground, the thought was an unpleasant one. John Patterson was able to shoot two rounds into the lion as it got dangerously close to him. It ran off into the brush. It wasn't until the next morning that the lion was found dead, 20 yards from where Patterson had shot him. The attack stopped, and construction resumed on the railroad. After he was successful in shooting the first lion, for a while the second lion disappeared, then several weeks later, came back, started again taking men night after night. One night while John Patterson stood watching a tree, the last rogue lion came to stalk his human prey. Patterson took two shots at the circling animal. The next evening, Patterson went out to find the wounded animal. Following the tracks, they spotted it. John Patterson wrote, I at once took careful aim and fired. Instantly, he sprang out and made a most determined charge down on us. I fired again and knocked him over. The second he was up once more and coming for me as fast as he could in his crippled condition. Running for his life, Patterson swung up on a branch as the enraged lion lunged at him. From the safety of his perch, Patterson got off another shot. The lion was hit again. It lay still on the ground. 
The reign of terror of the Savo lions was finally over, but not before the lions ate 135 men. The question still remains, what caused these lions to hunt human prey? Were they demons sent to stop the railroad as local legend suggests? Over 100 years later, scientists may have discovered a more practical answer, a simple sore tooth. And what this abscess means is that the Zavo lion would have had enormous pain with any sort of pressure on this tooth. So without the ability to clamp down and hold its prey, it simply would have been unable to kill a buffalo or zebra or any other large prey. And in consequence, this Zavo lion had no alternative but to pursue a prey that was slower and softer and much easier to kill than a buffalo. And the railroad workers who had few defenses against uh, these marauding lions were just camping in the wrong place at the wrong time. Or were the Savo lions genetic mutations with a taste for human flesh? These killers looked different than the other lions in Africa. They didn't possess the characteristic mane of the male, and they were unusually large, almost 10 feet long, and weighed close to 500 pounds. The Savo lions, they were almost a third larger than a normal lion. Talk about something with that kind of weight, that kind of holding, grabbing, and catching capacity. I mean, it, nobody would have a chance against them. And why were the lions so difficult to kill? They had so much trouble trapping and, and hunting, uh, where really lions aren't hard to hunt ordinarily. They, they seem to be much more intelligent, seem to know what they were doing. They had a plan. One thing is known for sure. Until finally stopped by an equally relentless hunter, these mysterious lions ruled the jungle and reigned supreme as the man-eaters of Tsavo. Later on In Search Of, can disembodied spirits take to the road? This driver found out the hard way. And next, think aliens are just here for a friendly visit? So did this man, until he experienced a close encounter of the worst kind. Our next story may contain information too sensitive for some to handle. The topic is alien abduction. Men and women snatched away to serve in experiments that left them scarred for life. Has Earth been the target of extraterrestrials? If so, why are experts terrified to acknowledge the alien menace? I think that the alien presence has been with us for at least 6,000 years, and I think they're here to stay until they get done what they intend to do. What we need to do is uh, get the facts out to people that not all UFOs and alien encounters are of the friendly type. Startling home video, shocking photos, and eyewitnesses have led many to believe that we are menaced by aliens. Now, we may be lucky and turn out that there are these really nice, friendly, huggable little ETs who are here to help us out. And I don't really see any evidence pointing in that direction. Richard Dolan is an author of a book that uncovers the truth behind government secrecy surrounding UFOs. He maintains that the public has to take seriously the alarming indications that aliens may indeed have evil intentions. Two examples, hideous mutilations and terrifying abductions. I have over a thousand cases on record and I've investigated more cases than that literally worldwide. Daryl Sims investigates abduction phenomena. Many people have had experiences that are so shocking that they simply, literally, don't want to remember. Daryl claims he was only four years old when he had his first conscious memory of being abducted. My events spanned from 1952 to 1965. Daddy! 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 For 13 years, these entities involved themselves in my life at the most inopportune times. His last experience was also the worst. Daryl remembers a total of five menacing aliens invading his room. I 
I have never experienced anything personally greater than what happened to me in a traumatic form at age 17. The, the, the absolute feeling of it is so horrific. And the helplessness, the fact that you, there's nothing you can do while these entities do what they do. There was no way I could live with this nightmare. I just was not going to do it. And I blocked out that entire area of my life. To make something positive of his traumatic close encounters, Daryl Sims has dedicated himself to other alleged victims of alien abduction. Through hypnotic regression, he helps them purge their bad memories. Daryl recorded this hypnotic regression with a home video camera. He was literally screaming so loud that he could not hear me give him suggestions to ease the pain. But a number of UFO researchers maintain that humans aren't the only species the aliens are experimenting with. For some unknown reason, cattle seem to have also been singled out. According to Richard Dolan's research, the statistics on these cases are staggering. Between 1973 and 1975, the state of Colorado confirmed more than 130 cattle mutilations. In the following decades, there have been approximately 10,000 mutilation reports. There is a real commonality among the different types of animal mutilations. Usually, there are organs removed. An expert in this field is biologist Colm Kelleher of the National Institute for Discovery Science. We know that there are perpetrators that were involved in the mutilation of these animals. Um, we don't know who those perpetrators are, but we, we definitely know that these were not a predator or scavenger. Even under a low-powered microscope, if you look at the skin of an animal, you can distinguish very easily between a sharp-cut instrument and the tearing associated with a predator or scavenger. One astonishing case study began one morning when a Colorado rancher and his wife were out tagging new calves in their herd. They went down to the next animal about 300 yards away and uh, proceeded to tag that animal and check other animals. About 30 minutes later, they noticed that the mother of the animal was acting strangely. So they, they came back up to investigate, and they found the, the calf that they had tagged 30 to 40 minutes previously lying spread-eagled on the ground. There was absolutely nothing left in the animal. There was no blood on the ground. There was no blood on the, the skin of the animal. All of the tissues had been removed with the two ranchers uh, 300 yards away. It had been removed in complete silence and in broad daylight. We had this professional tracker go over every inch of the ground for a mile radius around the animal, and not a single track was found. These reports are frightening enough, but according to author Jim Hickman, they pale next to newly uncovered stories that the aliens have also dissected human victims. The shocking evidence when we return. This program contains images which may be disturbing to younger or sensitive viewers. Parental discretion is advised. Is Earth the target of an alien invasion? According to UFO expert Jim Hickman, people have been the victims of extraterrestrial attacks. Many people have know about the cattle mutilations that have happened throughout the years, but uh, a lot of folks don't know about the uh, humans that have been involved in this. Okay, I don't think the aliens are being intentionally evil. I think they're performing a scientific experiment. I think that we're test subjects. After all, we tag animals in the wild all the time. We track them and monitor them. Sometimes we perform hideous procedures on animals. How unusual would it be that others might do the same to us? Probably the most famous one would be the White Sands case back in 1956. 
The serviceman had been abducted from the White Sands missile test area. And one of the majors that was stationed at White Sands saw a disc-shaped saucer, actually picked the uh, person up and, and put him into the saucer. The sergeant had been missing for three days when his mutilated body was found in the middle of the desert. There's no blood in the body at all. He had been mutilated in the classic style of cattle, and uh, the military intelligence people got involved, and uh, their conclusion was that it was an unknown incident. It was not a murder, at least not uh, by human hands. The best documented human mutilation case happened on the outskirts of Sao Paulo, Brazil. This horrific incident has been thoroughly investigated by Brazilian ufologist Encarnacion Zapata Garcia. She took our cameras to the site where the body was found, the Guarapriyanga Dam. In 1988, some children who were going fishing found the body of a man of approximately 50 years of age with some very strange bruises. The similarity between these photographs and the photographs of the mutilation cases of cattle and other animals in the United States, Canada, Brazil, and other parts of the world are great, very shocking, because not only externally, but also internally, the cases are very similar. I would almost say identical. In the Brazilian case, no one from the Sao Paulo Police Department or medical examiner's office was willing to publicly comment on this mysterious death. You know, maybe it's just possible that all this publicity on UFOs isn't a good thing. Maybe, just maybe, that there are good reasons for keeping this secret. Are we the target of alien invaders? We are still waiting for definitive proof. Until then, a little advice. Examine the evidence with an open mind and keep watching the skies. A haunting roadside encounter terrorized this couple. Their chilling story is more common than you think. Take a ride with a ghost. Next on In Search Of. Murderous bandits to high-speed collisions, taking to the road has always been a risky endeavor. But now, paranormal encounters have been reported by drivers navigating darkened roadways. Our next story takes us to a haunted stretch of highway where the living intersect with the dead. of the car, shaking, trembling, and feeling sick, and looked, and still nothing. And, well, she's got to be somewhere. She's got to be somewhere. I looked up to the right, and walking along the side of the road was a young girl in a white gown. I told my wife, I says, honey, wake up. I think I saw Resurrection Mary. absolutely terrified the family. Roadside phantoms, highway spirits. Hitchhiking ghosts appear, then vanish in the blink of an eye. It's a bizarre phenomenon that has occurred on the streets of Chicago and the rural highways of England. Though some lost souls appear as terrifying hags, one alleged spirit has enticed travelers with her beauty and charm. She is Chicago's most notorious ghost. Drivers who give her a ride swear she's real until she mysteriously disappears. Ghost hunter Richard Crow has spent 36 years studying the legend of Resurrection Mary. Mary was a beautiful young blonde Polish-American girl. And back in the mid-1930s, she just loved the big band sound. 
and she would get out as many nights per week as she could to hear the music and dance her heart out. But Mary's dancing days were cut tragically short. She was killed in an automobile accident after a night out in the town. Laid to rest in Resurrection Cemetery, she was wearing her favorite party dress and dancing shoes. Since her death in 1930, many claim to have encountered the ghost of Resurrection Mary. The most interesting account, especially because it involves physical evidence, was the report of a sighting that Mary was inside the front gates of Resurrection Cemetery uh, one night back in 1976. When the police arrived, Mary had once again vanished into the night. But what they did find was shocking. Two bars on the front gate, made of solid bronze, were pulled completely apart. And left behind were handprints in the form of scorch marks. That could only have been accomplished, according to the police, and as far as I'm concerned, by a supernatural entity, because there's no way it could have been faked without great expense, not in plain sight of constant flow of traffic out in that area. I really think that was physical evidence that Mary exists. That physical evidence has been supported by further eyewitness accounts. One foggy summer night in 1980, the legend of Resurrection Mary became a chilling reality for Sam Maranto and his wife, Julie. We were coming home early in the morning. It was between 1 o'clock and 1.30. And we were driving along uh, Route 171, which is Archer Road, heading towards home. I looked up to the right, and walking along the side of the road was a young girl in a white gown. First of all, I'm thinking, what is a young girl walking along the side of the road at this hour of the day? Sam slowed down to get a closer look. She was very pretty. She had blonde hair, it was up in pin curls, and she was holding with her left hand shoes, which I presume to be dancing shoes. Many alleged ghost sightings are accompanied by a sudden drop in temperature. And at that moment, Sam's car became ice cold. So I turned the heat on. Mind you now, it's August 23rd. And I rolled up, made sure the windows were up. And I looked back one more time to look at the girl, and she was still there walking along. Then a strange and overwhelming emotion hit Sam. All of a sudden, I had these weird, uncontrolled feelings. It was, my hair was standing up in the back of my neck, and I had uncontrollable tearing, this tearing and a very uh, sad feeling. So I decided I'm going to turn around and see if that was Resurrection Mary. But by the time Sam turned the car around, Resurrection Mary had vanished. I just didn't want to be just alone with my wife. I went to my parents' house, rang the doorbell. My brother Scott comes to the door. First thing he says to me is, Sam, looks like you saw a ghost. And I told him, I said, Scott, you know what? I think I did. It took Sam an entire year before he could drive down Archer Road again. I've never, ever felt that rotten in that short a period of time without any reason ever before, never. Paranormal researchers believe that if a person has died tragically or in a state of agitation, it is not uncommon for those who encounter the spirit to literally take on their emotions. The last night of her life, she was in the Willowbrook when she had a fight with her boyfriend, left the place in a huff, and it was that state of mind that led her to survive death and come back again and again. Over the years, several taxi cab drivers have described encounters with a beautiful passenger they believe to be Resurrection Mary. When the cabbie asks for directions, she leads him up Archer Road. Stop, this will be fine. The cabbie, knowing it's a cemetery on the right and a bunch of closed stores on the left, turns to ask her what she means. She's vanished. The spirit of Resurrection Mary is very much alive around Chicago. The southwest side, anywhere in that area, this ghostly young lady may be encountered when the sun goes down and the moon comes out, and out there on the roadways, the ghosts may walk. But Mary is not the only hitchhiking ghost. 4,000 miles across the Atlantic, a pair of spectral apparitions terrify British drivers. We'll have those shocking stories when we come back. It has been widely reported that the ghosts of a beautiful woman walks the Archer Road in Chicago. And according to eyewitness accounts, similar spirits haunt Bluebell Hill in Maidstone, England. The apparent victim of a tragic car crash that occurred in 1965 terrifies motorists by walking into the path 
of oncoming cars. She too is a young woman dressed in white. British researcher Sean Tudor relies on the evidence of highly credible testimony. I have around 20 named witness encounters describing the ghost of Bluebell Hill. In the most clear-cut examples where the motorists have struck the figure, they've been so convinced that they've had dealings with a real human being that they've gone off to the police to report uh, the incident, sure that they've, they've struck and killed someone. It happened on Bluebell Hill to Ian Sharp on the way home one night after his shift as a tour bus driver. Driving down the hill about 50 miles an hour, just coming home normally, I saw this lady didn't take a lot of notice. And I, she just stood there while I was approaching. And then she just ran straight out in front of the car. I was absolutely terrified. I just didn't know what to do. I got out of the car. I was shaking. I was scared. I thought, I've got to look. And I went to the front of the car, kneeled down and looked under the car. And there was nothing. Nothing at all. I walked to the back of the car, shaking, trembling, and feeling sick, and looked, and still nothing. And, well, she's got to be somewhere. She's got to be somewhere. Ian rushed to the local police station to file a report. Constable Roger Ginn was the officer on duty that night. Certainly, uh, Mr. Sharp, when I saw him, looked genuinely shocked, and, uh, worried that he had struck a pedestrian on Bluebell Hill. Ian and the officers went back to the scene of the accident to search for a body. Definitely just about here. You're absolutely terrified. You're scared stiff. And you're shaking, you're trembling because you know you've hit somebody. After an exhaustive search, the police came up cold. Ian Sharp would never really know what happened. Was he too tired to see and think clearly? Or did he have an actual hit and run encounter with the supernatural? There have been other sightings at Bluebell Hill, but these involve shocking encounters with a more terrifying phantom. Two families came forward to report um, what seems to be an entirely different character on Bluebell Hill. And this was of an old wizened figure of a, of a hag, a hunched um, old woman, um, very menacing appearance in dark clothing. This ghastly apparition actually hurls herself onto the windshield of cars. She absolutely terrified the family. The husband tried to get the car in gear to pull away. As they pulled away, the figure shuffled to the other side of the road and vanished from the roadside. The story seemed too detailed and well accounted to be dismissed as fatigue or white line fever. So heed this traveler's advisory. Keep both eyes on the road your hands on the wheel, and never stop the strangers. Thanks for watching In Search Of. I'm Mitch Pileggi. Good night. The following program deals with a controversial subject. The theories expressed are not the only possible interpretation. Viewers are invited to make a judgment based on all available information. This program contains images which may be disturbing to younger or sensitive viewers. Parental discretion is advised. Tonight on In Search Of. A savage beast brings terror to this lonely stretch of road. Many believe that the attacker is a werewolf. And can a curse that is nearly 3,300 years old still be blamed for numerous tragedies? We'll go in search of King Tut's curse. Has justice finally caught up with the world's most notorious skyjacker? We may have found D.B. Cooper. 
The Titanic sank nearly nine decades ago, but this man claims he went down with the ship. Oh, oh God, Johnny, look out! We'll hear his shocking story in search of reincarnation. I'm Mitch Pileggi, and this is In Search Of. Can a full moon trigger a transformation in man, making him a savage beast? A series of brutal encounters and medical discoveries have revived this chilling notion. Once a relic of drive-in horror movies, the legend of the Wolfman has jumped from the screen into the headlines. Come with us as we go in search of werewolves. Please! I know they're gonna catch me, but don't let anyone see me like that! Please, doctor, help me! It's very real. It's something we need to look at. It's frightening. We didn't know if the if the authorities actually believed in this werewolf story, but that they had just issued us silver bullets. It looks back and glares at them as if to say, you can't do anything to me. I felt like I was lunch. I felt I was done for. The image of the werewolf has long been the focus of many Hollywood creep shows. Gnashing teeth, razor sharp claws, and the notion that a human could shape shift itself into this terrifying creature kept moviegoers on the edge of their seats. But werewolf tales have always been based on the fear that these monsters may be real. It's no surprise that werewolf lore still permeates the villages of Transylvania. But recent news reports indicate that werewolves may actually be stalking the forests of North America. This is rural Wisconsin, a peaceful place. But there is something in the woods here that has the tiny community of Walworth on edge. They have felt the presence of a beast. They keep a watchful eye open for the Bray Road werewolf. It's hard to imagine on this bright spring day that anything spooky could have happened in this spot here on Hospital and Bray Road. Linda Godfrey is a newspaper reporter in the Walworth County area. Her news column covers everything from births to business. But it is her inquiring mind that has made her the local authority on the creature that roams these woods. We still weren't sure if it was really a story. And then upon a little bit further investigation, I found out that our county um, animal control officer actually had a manila file folder marked werewolf in his file drawer at the office. It had the names and uh, phone numbers and um, messages from people who had been calling him saying, I saw this thing. I don't know what it is. It's tall. It has a dog wolf head. Um, the closest thing I could think of is a werewolf. Linda's dogged detective work has led her to many eyewitnesses of the strange creature. But over the years, her sources have chosen to clam up rather than open up to public ridicule. According to Linda, one woman had a particularly shocking encounter. This woman was driving right along the roadside when she saw something sitting or kneeling by the side of the road. She slowed down to take a look, thinking maybe that a person was hurt, and she realized it was no person. She described a dog or wolf-headed creature, but larger than you would expect an animal like that to be. And in its large, upturned palms of its hands, she could see there were claws, and it had a piece of some kind of dead animal. She was just immediately terrified. 
This woman said that if there was such a thing as a werewolf, this is probably what it would look like. This account of the Bray Road werewolf reflects the typical sighting. However, at least one witness claimed that the creature has an aggressive nature. This was a woman who was a senior in high school. She was driving down Bray Road very late at night, and her car kind of, she felt it bump over something. She wanted to make sure that she hadn't, um, you know, actually hit someone. She got out, turned and looked around, and she could hear this boom, boom, boom of heavy feet hitting the pavement. And she saw a form in the darkness. Some kind of creature on two feet that began running toward her. Afterward, she vowed never to speak of the incident again. Even local Walworth law enforcement has had their fair share of wild reports. Well, I've been here ever since the legend started. It's always been unexplainable. Lieutenant Ron Person has been a sheriff in this county for 30 years. He is a no-nonsense lawman who does not believe in the existence of werewolves. Police officers always think that everything's explainable, has to be explainable. Um, in a case like this, if you're going to believe in it, it's unexplainable. There's definitely a lot of things that I can't see that do exist. And I believe that God exists, and I've never seen him or that particular being. And there's a possibility, I suppose, if one were to stretch their imagination, that werewolves could exist. And just in case they do. That's a 357 silver tip towel point bullet that our department issued to us at the same time that the werewolf story was running rampant in the papers. In a neighboring county, a similar creature has been spotted. Jessica Anderson came face to face with a form that will haunt her forever. We stood out here all summer, and um, you could watch the deer come by and everything. And in August, suddenly, everything stopped. I was sleeping in the bed. I woke up suddenly, and I sit up, and I look out. I see this thing. It had a wolfish face. It was standing upright, and it looked to be clawing at the window. Anderson noted something different, and perhaps telling about the wolf-like creature she saw. It looked starved. It looked like a starved, wolfish-looking creature. I felt like I was lunch. I felt I was done for. There is no evidence that this creature is of supernatural origin, and that leaves room for an intriguing theory. Could it be that the Bray Road werewolf is an evolutionary fluke with ties to a much more distant past? Ancient Greeks described a race of werewolves five centuries before the birth of Christ. They talked about the Nuri being a people or being that would once a year turn into werewolves. And if you look at some of the old legends from ancient Greek, you find that uh, they actually spoke of werewolves being part of the Olympics. Dr. Lauren Coleman is a cryptozoologist and author of Mysterious America. As an expert on ancient cultures and the werewolf phenomena, he offers this theory on the ancient Greek stories of werewolves. I think that it may be a remembrance to Neanderthal, that there may actually have been survival of Neanderthal late into uh, some of the historic times and these more hairy creatures coming from the hills being a little more ferocious than the Cro-Magnon may have uh, given rise to some of the werewolf legends. Is it possible that werewolves are evolved Neanderthals that have slipped through the fabric of modern civilization? Science has yet to prove such ideas, but the medical community recognizes that there is a werewolf disease and has even given it a name. Lycanthropy is really the belief that you are a werewolf. It's a psychological disorder. People really believe, either in their dreams, imaginations, out-of-body projections, all kinds of different ways, that they do become werewolves. 
The delusions of lycanthropy can't explain the monstrous appearance of the Bray Road beast. Could it be a missing link to prehistoric man? Do werewolves really exist? The truth and the beast may lie hidden beneath human skin until the next full moon. Coming up, did the world's most daring skyjacker lift to bury a fortune in cash? The answer may come from this woman who claims she married D.B. Cooper. And later on the show, do you believe in reincarnation? This man does, and he may have shocking facts to prove his case. But first, is the 3,200-year-old curse still claiming lives? We'll go in search of the answers. The mysteries of Egypt endure more than 4,000 years after the pyramid tombs rose in the desert. But some claim that the modern-day violation of one pharaoh's crypt may have unleashed an ancient terror. Is the curse of King Tut still claiming lives? The legacy of death triggered by the opening of his tomb lives on to this day. The answer may be found in a villa in northern Italy, our first stop in search of the mummy's curse. January 2001. A former model and millionaire socialite is found dead after disappearing from this luxurious Italian villa. That villa was once the property of a wealthy British lord who had financed the excavation of an ancient tomb. He was paid back with sudden death. The wealthy lord was assisted by an Egyptologist who laughed at a legendary curse and fell victim to a lethal illness. Could these three actually be victims of the mummy's curse? In 1922, Englishman Howard Carter made one of the most amazing archaeological finds in history. After years of painstaking effort in Egypt's famed Valley of the Kings, he had finally captured the treasure that had become his obsession, the tomb of King Tutankhamun. He had told his diggers to excavate deeper than before because his suspicion was that the tomb lay much further down. So his diggers were at work and suddenly they came upon a single step and Howard Carter immediately realized that this was probably it. After making the discovery, Carter resealed the entrance to Tutankhamun's tomb, placed guards around the burial site and waited for his English sponsor, Lord Carnarvon, who had financed the expedition. Amid the excitement came the first ominous warning of the mummy's curse. Carter had recently purchased a yellow canary. The workers on the tomb believed that the canary brought them great luck. But unfortunately, when Howard Carter was gone, a cobra came in and devoured the canary and swallowed it whole. Word leaked out to the workers that this had happened, and they were terrified because they saw the cobra as a symbol of the kings of, of Egypt. And they felt that the cobra was Tut's representative on Earth who had just destroyed the people who had violated his tomb. Soon after, Lord Carnarvon arrived from England, and the team entered the tomb. Howard Carter went in first. By candlelight, he peered in, and a very excited Lord Carnarvon said, do you see anything? And he said, yes, wonderful things. And he could see in there all of the treasures through the doorway, and he was only seeing a portion, a very small portion of what was there. What Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon viewed in the flickering candlelight, no human eye had seen for nearly 3,300 years. The monumental discovery soon became an international sensation. Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon were suddenly famous, but as their fortunes soared, tragedy struck Carnarvon with a fatal blow. He was bitten by a mosquito and the bite got infected. He developed a fever of 104 
and at that point started to deteriorate rapidly. The wound never healed, and a specialist flown into Cairo arrived too late. Carnarvon died seven weeks after the official opening of the tomb. The world press immediately saw in the tragic end of Carnarvon a sinister new beginning, that of the mummy's curse. The Egyptians used curses in a wide variety of ways. Our first examples are actually drawings or representations on walls of temples and tombs designed to perpetuate the defeat of an enemy. Controversy surrounds the curses believed to have been found within the tomb of Tutankhamun. There's some mystery surrounding two artifacts that were found in the tomb that are related to the curse. They were a tablet which had a warning that death would come to anyone who entered the tomb and disturbed its artifacts, and a statue which was the image of the protector of the tomb. The workers were extremely frightened, very worried about the curse. They were convinced they were going to die, and some of them were fleeing. The workers' fears were soon confirmed as many others associated with the tomb began to die. Thirteen dropped dead from fever and illness, including Arthur Mace, an archaeologist who helped unseal the tomb. Lord Carnarvon's secretary, Richard Bethel, died under mysterious circumstances. Bethel's father, obsessed with the curse, committed suicide, while others fell victim to tragic accidents. Dr. James Breasted, a prominent Egyptologist, described the curse as Tommy rot. I defy the curse, he declared. I slept in the tomb for two weeks and even had my meals there. I never felt better in my life. One year later, he was dead, the victim of a mysterious illness. Unwilling to believe that a curse could possibly be the source of so many deaths, some experts point elsewhere. People believe that the deaths that some people attribute to the curse of Tutankhamun actually has a scientific basis. And this would be that people were poisoned by spores and molds that are associated with mummies. But obviously, there were very many deaths where the people were not inside the tomb. So you still have to account for those. Even if you say, yes, I believe that a disease is at work, you still have to account for those remaining deaths. By 1939, Tutankhamun's remains were placed back in his tomb after 17 long years of examination. For nearly three decades, the curse would lie dormant until a decision was made to interrupt the king's eternal rest once again. Tut's royal possessions, meant to accompany him on his journey to the next world, were to go on a world tour. Mohammed Ibrahim was Egypt's director of antiquities. In 1966, there was a director of antiquities in Egypt that was concerned about the artifacts from the tomb going on exhibit. He went to the French government, who was planning to do this exhibit in cooperation with Egypt, and tried to convince them not to do it and they refused, and when he walked out of that meeting, he was struck and killed by a car. After the world tour, Tut's possessions were returned to the Cairo Museum, where they remain to this day. For many, the horrors of the mummy's curse seem to have finally ended, or have they? More recently, the mysterious death of Countess Francesca Vaca Augusta led some to blame the curse of Tutankhamun. A beautiful model and wealthy heiress, the Countess lived in the Italian villa that had been the family home of Lord Carnarvon for generations. She disappeared from the villa January 8, 2001. 14 days later, her body washed ashore in France. According to one local historian, another female relative had died in a similar fashion and some claim that Carnarvon had brought King Tut's curse to the villa. Howard Carter, the man most responsible for the opening of the tomb, did not escape unscathed. He died in 1939, disillusioned and exhausted. Prior to Carter's discovery, Tutankhamun had been a minor pharaoh forgotten by history. Today, he is the most famous of all the ancient Egyptian kings. 
Tut's fabulous treasure and legendary curse have given the dead king what he wanted most in life, immortality. Later on In Search Of, watch this man relive the final moments of his life during one of the most infamous tragedies in history. But first, he cheated death with the boldest robbery ever attempted, but his luck may have just run out. In Search Of D.B. Cooper, next. It was one of the most brazen crimes in American history. With $200,000 and a parachute, D.B. Cooper made the leap from skyjacker to folk legend. Now, a shocking deathbed confession may lead to a buried fortune and solve the mystery of D.B. Cooper. A dogged FBI agent, an intrepid investigative reporter, a veteran skydiver, and a determined housewife. All of these people have something in common. Each may hold the key to solving one of the biggest mysteries of the 20th century. The story of D.B. Cooper begins on November 24th, 1971. Northwest Orient Flight 305 had taken off from Portland, Oregon, en route to Seattle, Washington. A man wearing a dark suit, sitting in seat 18C, handed the flight attendant a note. It said he would blow up the plane if he did not receive $200,000 in cash and four parachutes when they touched down in Seattle. The man in seat 18C called himself Dan Cooper. The FBI was contacted and Ralph Hemmelsbach was one of the first agents assigned to the case. Ralph recalls what happened when the plane landed in Seattle. He permitted it to land. They put the parachutes and the money on board, refueled the airplane, released the passengers, and the flight continued, uh, took off, and headed for Reno, Nevada. During that flight, about 35 minutes after the aircraft took off, uh, the hijacker bailed out. What resulted was one of the largest manhunts in American history. Dan Cooper, whose name was mistakenly reported as D.B. Cooper, got away with $200,000. As time passed and the crime went unsolved, investigators hit a brick wall. For 24 years, the case remained dead until March of 1995. Florida antique dealer Dwayne Weber, dying of a kidney disease, told his wife, Joe an extraordinary secret he had been keeping for over 20 years. He says, come here, I've got something to tell you. And he kept wanting me to come closer. And he said, I'm Dan Cooper. I'm Dan Cooper. It's the way he said it, I'm Dan Cooper. He didn't say Cooper, Cooper. He got very, very angry. And he says, oh, let it die with me. Those were some of the last words Dwayne spoke before he died, and they left Joe confused until the day she coincidentally thumbed through a book on D.B. Cooper. The other thing that was in the book, they said that D.B. Cooper's name was not D.B. Cooper. The name given at the ticket gate was Dan Cooper. All of a sudden, the things he told me in the hospital made sense. I got one-third of the way through the book, I was on the phone to the FBI. Joe also enlisted the aid of investigative journalist Doug Pasternak, who wrote an article for U.S. News & World Report about the Dwayne Weber, D.B. Cooper connection. I first got interested in this story when Joe Weber called me about three or four years ago, and she started putting the pieces of this puzzle together and wanted an investigative reporter to help her track some records down, where I helped steer her in the right direction. Hemmelsbach was struck by the eerie similarities between a photo of a young Dwayne Weber and the FBI composite sketch of D.B. Cooper. 
This is an artist's conception of Dan Cooper, and he also appears here wearing dark glasses. These are photographs of Dwayne Weber taken at different stages in his life, and there is some resemblance. Hemmelsbach believes that whoever Cooper was, he was ill-prepared to survive a jump from a 727. And he was wearing a business suit and slip-on loafers on his feet. He didn't have the items of personal equipment that he should have had for that jump. It is, in my view, and the view of most other parachute authorities, that he could not have landed uninjured. But Doug Pasternak found out that Dwayne Weber had been an Army paratrooper, and world skydiving champion Guy Manos has every reason to believe that Cooper was an expert skydiver. The skydiving community is very small, and back in the 70s, when the D.B. Cooper thing went down, it was an even smaller community. And so all of us that were jumping then were convinced that we must know who it is, because only a skydiver could even conceive of such a thing. Manos is convinced that the notorious skyjacker survived his jump. He's done it himself. I've got a uh, half dozen jumps out of a 727. Dwayne Weber would have been about the same age as the hijacker. And amongst the evidence discovered by Joe was an airline ticket she found that made Dwayne extremely nervous. We had some old tax records from 1990 that were just thrown in one big old box. I saw this ticket. It was a Northwest Airline ticket. It was from Portland to Seattle. I looked at the date. I said, God, this is an old ticket. He says, it doesn't mean anything anymore. One of the many secrets Dwayne kept from Joe was how much time he'd actually spent in the Pacific Northwest. Jim Stallings was a very good friend of Dwayne Weber's. And Dwayne Weber used to discuss with his friend Jim about living out in the Northwest. They used to have discussions about living in Portland back in the 1950s and 60s. This meant that he knew the Northwest. Again, it was something that his wife never knew. He had uh, once been uh, incarcerated at McNeil Island Federal Penitentiary in Washington. Joe recalls a nightmare of Dwayne's that seems strikingly real and had relevance to the Cooper skyjacking. One of the triggers was not just the description of D.B. Cooper, but when they mentioned the F stairs, I went berserk because immediately I remembered a dream that he had had, a dream where he was talking in his sleep. I left my fingerprints on the aft stair. Cooper made his exit via the back or aft stairs. But Cooper jumped out of that plane with $200,000. What happened to the money? Startling information when we come back. This program contains images which may be disturbing to younger or sensitive viewers. Parental discretion is advised. On his deathbed, Florida antique dealer Dwayne Weber claimed to be the notorious Dan D.B. Cooper. And if Weber was Cooper, and he survived the perilous jump from a 727, whatever became of the $200,000 that Cooper jumped with? A few days before Dwayne passed away, Joe and this woman he worked with as well were in his hospital room, and he blurted out, I buried $173,000 in a bucket, and I forgot where I buried the bucket. Joe couldn't find the bucket after Dwayne's death, but she did recall an unusual incident that may offer a clue. There was a road here. This is it. Back in the fall of 1979, just about two years after they were married, they took a trip to the Seattle area and also drove down to Portland. And at one point, Joe remembers they drove down a dirt road. Dwayne stopped the car. He asked her to stay in the car. He walked down to the river, and she was in the car for about 10 minutes. And he came back. She didn't know anything about D.B. Cooper at the time or about her husband's criminal past or anything about that. But a few months later, 
a boy in the area digging a fire pit discovered $5,800 from the D.B. Cooper ransom money. It was the only money ever recovered from the hijacking. No more physical evidence has been discovered, so the search for conclusive proof that Dwayne Weber was Dan D.B. Cooper continues. If there was one question that I would ask him is why did you put all this on me? Why didn't you just go on? Why have I had to go through this for you? With a lack of physical evidence, experts today believe it would be hard to prove Dwayne Weber was really D.B. Cooper. Unfortunately, the only person who may have known the truth is no longer able to tell. Do you believe that this man lost his life in the sinking of the Titanic? He says he can prove it. Bill Barnes' shocking story, next on In Search Of. April 14th, 1912. Screams of horror mingle with the death rattle of a great ship as the Titanic begins her plunge toward the bottom of the North Atlantic. Bill Barnes relives that agony in vivid detail over and over again. The New Mexico resident believes that he sailed aboard the doomed ocean liner and died in the icy water. His story may provide striking evidence of reincarnation. And he's not alone. What if your memories were not your own? A certain smell or a certain sound or a certain color may, uh, for many people, stimulate a, a memory of perhaps a picnic or uh, something that they did in their life. Well, for me, these same triggers would stimulate a memory of something that had absolutely nothing to do with my present life. I recognize this place, and not as Bob Snow as whoever I was in that, in that body at the time. What if this life is just one in a series of lives that we've experienced through time? I always had it in the back of my mind that I had something to do with Titanic. I heard him literally shout out in his sleep, um, oh no, they need to use a new code, SOS. And you begin to wonder, well, what's going on here? Why do I remember this? Or why is this even here? It has nothing to do with my experience. It was so unbelievably vivid. It was almost it was as, as you were there. You were really there. You weren't just imagining it or seeing it. You were there. Under hypnosis, Robert Snow and Bill Barnes were taken back in time in a process called past life regression. I'm going to turn the hourglass upside down now, Bill. Many believe it is a way to tap into our subconscious knowledge of other lives we have lived. The body dies, but not the soul. The soul selects other bodies to keep coming back, back, and back, and back, until you do whatever it is that you were supposed to accomplish in this lifetime. Can the soul pass through bodies, taking with it tiny fragments of former memories? Are these subconscious images proof of reincarnation, the belief that we are destined to live many lives? Almost everyone has had a previous lifetime, but they forget it. Skeptics claim that past lives are nothing more than byproducts of overactive imaginations, spurred on by the power of suggestion. People wonder, are these experiences for real? Is it something that this mind has made up, especially under hypnosis? Uh, let me tell you something about a person under hypnosis. They don't know the next question you're going to ask them. And the emotion, difficult to fake emotions under hypnosis. One skeptic that tested the case for reincarnation was Robert Snow, captain of homicide for the Indianapolis Police Department. These kind of things don't happen to real people. I mean, they happen on the X-Files, they happen in movies and in books. R things like this don't happen to real people. On a dare, Snow was persuaded to participate in past life regression. I didn't think I could be hypnotized. I thought, I'm much too strong-willed. There's no way to hypnotize me. But the hard-boiled detective was softened by the hypnotic words and found himself traveling back through time. Suddenly, Snow was in a studio, painting on a canvas. I could see I was painting a portrait. 
I could see, I could look down, I could see the brush of my hand. I was just putting the faintest touch on a portrait. Extraordinarily clear. I could see every brush stroke of this portrait. Snow was haunted by the images he recounted during his regression, but he was not convinced they were proof of a past life. Armed with a no-nonsense attitude and sharp investigative skills, he went in search of answers. So I started looking through the art books. I started visiting some art galleries. I searched and talked and checked with people for almost a year and never found anything. A year and a half later, he was ready to call it quits. But a fateful trip to a New Orleans art gallery changed everything. And I started to walk by. It's like I walked in a glass wall. I, I stopped so suddenly. It was the painting I'd see myself painting as, as the artist. It was the woman I'd see myself painting. The artist was James Carroll Beckwith, a little-known painter from the late 1800s. The last public exhibition of Beckwith's work was in 1912. Robert Snow could not have seen this painting during his current life. Even more shocking was the discovery of Beckwith's personal diaries. They proved without a doubt that almost every recollection Snow had under hypnosis actually happened in Beckwith's life, nearly 100 years earlier. I found all kind of interesting parallels between Beckwith and myself. In his diary, other than his wife, he mentions two women he thought were very, very physically attractive. One was a Miss Morgan, and one was a Miss Wolf. Well, I've been married twice. My first wife's name was Morgan when I met her. My second wife's name was Wolf when I met her. Makes you kind of give you chills. These parallels between a past and a current life convinced Robert Snow that he had been reincarnated. But Bill Barnes, a retired teacher from Arizona, had a different kind of past life experience. Since childhood, Barnes has had what are called spontaneous memories of another life. A life that ended with one of the most infamous disasters in history. You'll meet the man who claims he went down with the Titanic when we return. Is reincarnation possible? Are we destined to live again? And if so, would we cling to the memory of an earlier life? When I was between three and four years old, I began to correct my mother when she would call me Billy. And I would tell her my name was really Tommy. And at around that time, I started drawing pictures of ships on the walls to my mother's dismay, of course. And they all had four smokestacks. And I would tell her that this was my ship, but it died. As an adult, Barnes was plagued with relentless nightmares and a foreboding sense of doom. He finally sought help from clinical hypnotherapist, Dr. Frank Baranowski. When Bill came to see me for the first time, I listened to his story, and uh, I picked up a little bit that he possibly was frightened of water. And we were just going to go into that thing to see why he was terrified of water. I didn't expect what came out? What came out was beyond belief. Under regression, Bill Barnes discovers the secret buried in his subconscious memories. What do you see? Well, the shipyard. How were you called, sir? Well, everybody calls me Tommy. How long do you think it'll take you to complete this, this big boat you're working on now? Well, there's two of them. One of them is to go out in 11, and the other is to go out in 12. Which one is that in 12? Titanic. Barnes was Tommy Andrews, the shipbuilder of the legendary Titanic. Having a bad feeling about this ship. Bloody fool, you should have hit it head on. Should have hit what head on? The berg. There's a berg out there? We hit a berg. Well, look at this, there's a... She's listening, look at the gauge. She hasn't been 10 minutes. Is that dangerous? It means we're taking on a lot of water. Bruce Ismay was the financier behind the ill-fated floating palace. According to legend, he was motivated by money not the safety of his passengers. What does Ishmael say? He says, how can I, how can I know that? It's because I built the bloody ship. 
I know how she lives. I know how she's going to die. Oh, good God, do not let her go down. Oh, my beautiful ship. Do not let her sink, not with all those people. I'm, I'm trying to hold on to the stern, but I can I cannot grasp it. What's going to happen to your ship? I'm never going to see home again. Why do you say that? She's dead. As Tommy Andrews, Barnes witnessed one of the worst disasters of the 20th century. I did not completely believe I was Tommy Andrews. What convinced me was when I had taken all the elements of his life and put them into a historical timeline, and I found that at least 85, if not 95%, of what had occurred on the tapes had been recorded or at least matched up with a timeline for Titanic. Recent public fascination with the Titanic could account for Bill's recitation of certain facts. But how does that explain his unusual accent or intricate knowledge of early 1900s shipbuilding? The interesting thing about this whole subject of naval architecture is that my education has nothing to do with it. I can't even build a hen house right. I mean, I'm not, not really that, that good with tools. And yet I can look, just look at a model of Titanic or look at blueprints and start to say, well, this is why such and such happened. This is what this means. Now anchored safely in the present, Bill has written a book about his traumatic past life experience. I'm willing to risk being told you're crazy or to be ridiculed by people to say, this is, this is my truth. This is what I know to be right. And I don't care what anybody says. I know what I know. Are these stories confirmation that we have lived past lives? Like many policemen, Robert Snow was a hard-boiled skeptic. He is now a believer. The hardest part was changing your look outlook on the world, realizing that you've been wrong your whole life, that the world is not the way you think it is. As a teacher, Bill Barnes has devoted his life to the pursuit of reason and truth, and he is a believer. What you learn is that you're eternal. You know, you may die, but it's not going to take away the essence of, of your life or the essence of what makes you who you are. Can the graceful skill of a long dead artist be reborn in the calloused hands of a tough cop? Has a dark moment in history been branded into this man's soul? In the form of Bill Barnes, it seems unlikely that Tommy Andrews will ever escape from the Titanic. And if Barnes himself hopes to find peace, he may have to wait for his next reincarnation. Thanks for watching In Search Of. I'm Mitch Pileggi. Good night. The following program deals with a controversial subject. The theories expressed are not the only possible interpretation. Viewers are invited to make a judgment based on all available information. This program contains images which may be disturbing to younger or sensitive viewers. Parental discretion is advised. Tonight on In Search Of. A 19th century killer still stalks his victim to the rooms of a Kentucky dance club. I believe somewhere on this property, Pearl Bryan's head is under this ground. A woman bleeds incessantly from her hands and eyes. Is it a sign from God? We'll uncover the secret power of stigmata.
and Ghostbusters chase a crew of supernatural sailors. Prepare to board the Haunted Hornet. And our expedition into the dark side of voodoo leads to one shocking conclusion. Zombies, the nightmarish creatures of film and legend, may be real. I'm Mitch Pileggi, and this is In Search Of. The stroke of an axe sends one innocent woman to her grave and two Satan-worshipping killers to the gallows. But the story doesn't end with their deaths. In western Kentucky, a housewife, a nightclub handyman, and a security guard are given front row tickets to the grim reprise of that violent crime. The stage, Mackey's Bar, where country music fans share the dance floor with ghosts. I had never did believe in ghosts or spirits, whatever, till that night. I spun around, and there stood an image of a man. Well, there's evil spirits on this earth, and I experienced and seen it. I came down here one night, and there was a man standing right there. It wasn't just like uh, hearing a thump in the night. I actually seen a human form in cloud shape. Wilder, Kentucky. In 1978, Bobby Mackey purchased this century-old banquet hall to open a country and western music club where he could lead the band. But from the beginning, there was something very strange about Bobby Mackey's music world. I had never felt comfortable coming in here by myself. Uh, it just always felt like real cold and, and just so alone in here, it was so dark. Bobby wasn't the only one that sensed something foreboding. Carl Lawson was hired to be the live-in caretaker for the club. There's always been something here. This room of all parts of this, you know, this basement has always had a, I could feel more activity in here. During the long days and nights that Carl spent on the property, he would often have the feeling of being manipulated by dark spirits that were pulling him into the basement. Carl knew there was something terrible hidden under the floorboards. I first got that little hole in the floor, I seen that it was hollow. And I didn't realize there was a well under there. Lawson reported a foul stench and that he could hear the voice of a woman crying from deep within the well. Carl Lawson was tuning into the past. 100 years earlier, the building had been a ritual gathering place for a local band of Satanists. Writer Doug Hensley has long had an interest in the paranormal. Devil worshipers came to that well ever so often and crawled down inside of it to worship Satan because of the blood spilled on this ground. Hensley soon made a startling discovery that connected the music hall with one of the most shocking crimes in Kentucky history. During my research at the library, I learned in 1896, a woman named Pearl Bryan from Greencastle, Indiana, was murdered approximately three miles from here. Pearl Bryan was five and a half months pregnant when she was murdered. She had been decapitated. Her head was never found. The grisly and shocking nature of the crime made the headlines. When her body was found, the police with bloodhounds, they tracked the killers to this very site. At that time, it was a slaughterhouse. Alonzo Walling and Scott Jackson, two medical students with ties to the satanic cult, were arrested. They were captured in the bloody slaughterhouse well. It is believed that Pearl Bryan's murder 
was a sacrifice to Satan, and that Walling and Jackson used her severed head in an attempt to conjure up demonic forces. Walling and Jackson were convicted and sentenced to die. On the gallows, a life sentence was offered to the men if they would reveal the whereabouts of Pearl Bryan's head. Both men refused. However, Alonzo Walling swore a curse on the gallow and said that he would come back and haunt this area forever. This was the legacy Bobby Mackey was to inherit 82 years later. He and Carl had made a pact to try and keep the disturbing events a secret, but it wasn't up to them. It was a Friday night. I come into Bobby Mackey's, and I was getting all primed up, and I come in to go dancing. Country music enthusiast Rich Lawson is a club regular. I went to the restroom. I was washing my hands in the wash basin. And there was a garbage can right beside the wash basin. It just, bam, took off real fast. I spun around, and there stood an image of a man. It's like it's staring right, whole right through me. The bathroom just got intensely hot, and I'm trying to gasp for breath, and I passed out in the bathroom. The frightening sounds coming from the men's room alerted retired police officer Larry Hornsby. I went in the bathroom. It was hot. I mean, red hot. The bathroom couldn't be hot because it didn't have no heat in it. All I heard was kaboom, kaboom, kaboom. I looked around the corner. That garbage can was banging against the stall. Hornsby discovered Rich passed out on the floor. In a panic, he yelled into Rich's face to revive him. I said, Rich, talk to me, talk to me. So I picked up his hand, checked for a pulse. I couldn't find one there. I told him, call 911. I'm losing him. I'm losing him. It wasn't until the paramedics arrived that Rich Lawson was revived. Later, Larry Hornsby showed Rich Lawson pictures from Doug Hensley's book on the haunting. This face in this book, just like it came right out. And I almost knocked it in the road. I told him, get out of my face. Get it away from me. Rich Lawson identified the ghost that had attacked him as that of Alonzo Walling. It's no joke. The evil, there's evil spirits on this earth, and I've experienced and seen it. After the attack on Rich Lawson, Doug Hensley began to interview other customers. I started seeing a common pattern where some of them would see a headless woman. Some would see a dark, a dark haired stranger with a mustache. Was the headless woman the ghost of Pearl Bryan? And had the angry spirit of Alonzo Walling returned to seek his vengeance? One morning while the club was closed, Bobby's wife, Janet Mackey, was inside doing some work. Janet was five and a half months pregnant and very afraid because Pearl Bryan was also five and a half months pregnant at the time of her beheading. Janet's fears were soon confirmed. A force grabbed her from behind and squeezed her stomach. This invisible force shoved her down the stairs. She toppled down the stairs, five and a half months pregnant. She said she looked up and she saw the image of a man with a mustache standing at the top of the stairs. Janet went into premature labor and gave birth to a one pound, 15 and a half ounce baby girl that very night. Janet Mackey declined to be interviewed for this story. For her, the haunting is frighteningly real. However, she did sign an affidavit. I, Janet Mackey, have experienced a force that has tried to harm me. I have heard voices that have ordered me from the building. Sometimes, it seems that some force has entered my body. She won't come in here anymore. She never did like the place, and she hasn't been in here for two years. It's my opinion through the investigation that the one ghost is Alonzo Walling. Pearl Bryan's spirit walks this hall. I believe somewhere on this property, Pearl Bryan's head is under this ground. Pearl Bryan's body lies in a 100-year-old grave in Greencastle, Indiana. To this day, it is traditional for people who visit her grave to leave a Lincoln penny head side up so that Pearl Bryan can have a head once again, a fitting tribute to the ghost of Mackey's Bar.
Coming up, a ghostly crew haunts this U.S. aircraft carrier. And later in the show, we continue the hunt for zombies. But first, could these wounds signify the end of the world? We're going in search of stigmata. It's a shocking spectacle. Ordinary men and women, their hands, head and feet, bleeding with the wounds of Christ on the cross. Is it a hoax? An astonishing medical phenomenon? Or a grave omen foretelling the end of life as we know it? We warn you that some of the footage you're about to see is of a graphic and disturbing nature. These are the scars of stigmata. I don't know why he didn't bleed to death. Um, his whole life is beyond medical explanation. But I think it was just an ongoing visible sign to generation after generation that this person has been chosen by God. The bleeding happens every day. It's been happening for 11 years. Stigmata originated from a Greek word describing a mark or wound and specifically describes the disturbing phenomenon of a person who displays the sacred wounds of Jesus Christ in the same excruciating manner as how he died on the cross. Shocking evidence seems to support the claims that these three people suffered the stigmata. This story contains rare and startling footage of the strange phenomena, and you should be warned that this subject matter is not for the squeamish. They literally feel the suffering that Jesus felt when he went through this. They're feeling the piercing of the hands, they're feeling the piercing of the feet, the side wound, the crown of thorns, completing a, the actual crucifixion of Jesus. Michael Fries is the author of a book that examines the mystery of stigmata. Theologians and and the medical people all work together on this, and they've come up with a lot of um, signs they look for to distinguish authentic stigmata. The wounds are usually permanent. The wounds have fresh red blood, and usually any medical treatment, any ointments, any medicines doesn't affect uh, the bleeding or the wounds. The first stigmatic that the Catholic Church traditionally recognizes is St. Francis of Assisi. He received the stigmata and kept the stigmata for two years until his death in uh, 1226. Yet there have been uh, 321 reported alleged authentic cases of uh, the stigmata since the 13th century, Francis of Assisi's time. And it's a combination of many different types of people, lay people and religious. An Italian priest, Padre Pio, is considered the most authentic and well-known stigmatic of our generation. He bore the pain of stigmata longer than anyone in history. 50 years, from 1918 until his death in 1968. It's a very difficult thing to talk about the suffering of Padre Pio, the pain that he endured, because I can tell you he had the five wounds, they're medically documented. He was bleeding constantly, every day. At one point, the doctors took their fingers, shoved them through the hole in the hand, and they could feel them touching one another inside the wound. Even more unexplainable was the fact that Padre Pio's wounds literally disappeared right before his death in 1968. It's a miracle in itself that he would have all these bleeding wounds that didn't infect for all those years, and suddenly they've just disappeared with no scars. That's unheard of in the medical world. The Catholic Church has already beatified this beloved priest, and he is expected to be canonized as a saint. During the same time that Padre Pio bore the wounds of Christ, another lesser known stigmatic was also living a bizarre existence in Konnersreuth, a small town in Germany. Therese Neumann was born on Good Friday, April 9th, 1898. And it was on Good Friday in 1926 that she experienced the agonizing pain of her first stigmata. For the next 36 years, she bled profusely every Friday, 
on the day known as Crucifixion Day. I think in the Gospel of Luke, it talks about Jesus agonizing so much that he sweated or cried tears of blood. And remarkably, she bled uh, horrendously from her eyes all the time when she had her passion ecstasy. She has some 800 different passion ecstasies on a weekly basis throughout her life. And she kept the stigmata up to her death in 1962. But from 1926 on, she stopped eating except for the Eucharist on a daily basis. And she's been one of the most thoroughly investigated stigmatics in history. And nobody could find any evidence of a hoax or, or her eating on the side, but she actually didn't lose any weight over the decades, and she gained weight every decade. And she also slept very little, maybe an hour or two a day, all those decades. I believe that we do have many cases of authentic stigmatics in our midst. There is a current case of a man who lives today in a small seaside community in Italy, not far from the home of Padre Pio. Giorgio Bongiovanni claims to have been bleeding from a variety of wounds on a daily basis for nearly the past 12 years. This cross on my forehead is the sign that Christ will appear in heaven and all the world will see him. Jesus will manifest himself. It will be so. That is why I received this sign. In August of 1989, I had an extraordinary vision. I had just left my office, and I was walking toward my car. Suddenly, I saw a being about 20 meters away from me. It was radiating strong light and it was levitating. I can't really remember if she moved her lips, but I was struck by the graceful movement of her hands. At that moment, I was no longer myself. I was living this incredible experience that filled me with immense joy. Giorgio believes that it was the Virgin Mary who appeared before him in this vision. She spoke telepathically, instructing him to pray and prepare himself for a mission. Then she vanished, and I was in shock. I went home distraught. Later, while on a pilgrimage to Fatima, Portugal, Giorgio found himself walking through the church square when the holy vision appeared again. She explained what my mission to the world was. Then she asked me, are you ready to share the suffering of my son? I answered, yes. Then I saw a beam of light come out of the center of her body and hit the palms of my hands. Blood came pouring out of my hands. And that is the moment I received the stigmata. I felt a great deal of pain, excruciating pain, but inside I was serene. For the first two years, not only for a day, but for two years, I kept feeling such spasms that my whole body shook. I just couldn't stand the pain. Then, a little at a time, my body got used to it. The pain is still there, but now it's more bearable. Only when the wounds start to bleed again, it becomes terrible again. Giorgio's wounds open and bleed every 24 hours. If they continue for the rest of my life, then I will spend my life serving the cause as I was told to do. The mission, as revealed by the Virgin Mary, is for Giorgio to go public with an ominous warning about future events that could lead to a third world war. I hope this war will never happen. We can still avoid it, but there will be suffering for millions if mankind doesn't change its ways. 
Giorgio has submitted himself to examination from doctors who took blood samples and have confirmed that, incredibly, he shows no signs of anemia. Plus, his wounds are inexplicably without infection. Giorgio Bongiovanni has been examined by medical experts. And while none could explain the cause of his stigmata, a medically documented condition called psychogenic pupuris has been cited as a possible cause for the phenomenon. Patients with this disorder exhibit painful bruising and swelling beneath the skin. In some cases, blood will seep through the surface of skin that is still intact. This does not explain the gaping wounds evident in stigmatics. We have not come up with a real feasible medical explanation. All we have is speculation. The significance of the stigmata is, is, would have to be taken from a religious point of view, but that's the only place where it would make any sense. It's really something deeper than something scientific. It's something that comes from the depths of a person. Although Giorgio Bongiovanni's stigmata has been well documented, the Catholic Church is currently unwilling to formally comment on his case. This sign was given to me to make the people believe, to help me make people aware of my message. But it's their choice whether they want to believe me or not. It remains a mystery of faith that we ought to believe because of the credibility of the many cases documented. We shouldn't believe all of the cases. We should be skeptical, but be open-minded about it as well. These are just three striking cases, representing hundreds of reports from around the world. Different people, different places, separate lives, all connected by the blood and mystery of stigmata. Next, is it possible to survive your own death and burial? Walk with the living dead in search of zombies. But first, board the warship that the dead refuse to surrender. With this next story, modern-day ghost chasers and long-dead war heroes give new meaning to the term fighting spirit. In 1942, an American aircraft carrier was severely damaged by Japanese gunfire. Now, nearly six decades later, her ghostly crew won't give up the ship. A series of haunting encounters seems to prove that the men of the USS Hornet are still manning their battle stations. Some people have walked through here and actually felt an entity or a being walk right through them. They saw a very large shadow go across the foot of my bed. It seems like word has been sent out on the, the spiritual internet that this is the happening place for guys to come back to, to retire to. From time immemorial, man has clung steadfastly to the belief that the dead walk among us. Is it possible that the human soul survives death taking the form of a ghost? According to believers of the paranormal, ghosts often lurk in places haunted by tragic events of the past. Here, poltergeists and other unearthly spirits are said to torment, and in some cases, physically attack the living. And some say the dead may simply be attending to unfinished business. This is the USS Hornet. According to credible accounts, the souls of dead heroes have made this aging warship their home. I started to hear stories uh, from uh, our volunteers that were working around the ship of uh, seeing shadows, of seeing uh, uh, shapes uh, in the passageways.
Right over here on that middle catwalk where that door is, I saw a sailor leaning against the railings there, staring down at me while I was restoring the area in here. All of a sudden, I started feeling something tugging on my leg. And my first thought was, is one of the other guys playing a joke on me here on the ship? And I got up, found my flashlight, and turned it on, and there was nobody there, and there was no walking sound or anybody else around. These supernatural visitors may have ties to the most brutal war the world has ever known. In April 1942, CV-8, an aircraft carrier designated USS Hornet, was the launch site for the famous Doolittle raid on Tokyo. Six months later, the Hornet succumbed to enemy fire and plunged into the depths of the Pacific Ocean. 133 sailors lost their lives. But the spirit of the Hornet would live on with the christening of a new ship, also named USS Hornet. In 1943, the new vessel, which was given the call sign Gray Ghost, embarked on an illustrious career striking blow after blow against the enemy to avenge the deaths of those 133 sailors. A quarter century later, she enjoyed the honor of picking up the astronauts of Apollo 11. But in 1993, after more than a half century of distinguished service to her country, the USS Hornet's run of good luck came to an end. Obsolete and abandoned, she was offered to scrap metal dealers for a paltry $6 a ton. We realized that she was such a national treasure that she really shouldn't be scrapped, so a, a group of people got together and started the aircraft carrier Hornet Foundation. It was a monumental task, and as work progressed on the rusting Leviathan, many of the workers began to sense that they were sharing her with another presence. Rumors of ghosts began to circulate among the men restoring the old aircraft carrier. Had the long-deceased crew of the Hornet come back to help save their beloved ship? I saw right in the uh, compartment on the, on the Admiral's Bridge in which we're standing right now, uh, a gentleman with a long sleeve khaki uniform going down the ladder. I don't know what to say about that, except that he turned over his shoulder and looked at me. So I went, went after him and went down the ladder and called after him. Couldn't find anybody. I was at my file drawers, which were about 10, 12 feet away, and I'd opened the file drawer, and all at once I heard big band music being played in my office. And it's coming from my tape deck, and there's no buttons pushed in my tape deck. Coming up. Ghostbusters scour the decks to identify the Phantom Commander of the Haunted Hornet. This program contains images which may be disturbing to younger or sensitive viewers. Parental discretion is advised. As preservationists attempted to restore the legendary USS Hornet to her former glory, they encountered entities that can only be described as otherworldly. Ghostly apparitions descended ladders, pinched female volunteers, and even appeared on the flight deck. In 1998, the Aircraft Carrier Hornet Foundation faced a critical decision. Deny all evidence of the supernatural or confront the possibility that the ship was filled with ghosts. Concerned that the ship's ghostly inhabitants would frighten away tourists, the Foundation called in psychic Stash Murray and renowned paranormal investigator Lloyd Auerbach. Auerbach, an expert witness and consultant for several law enforcement agencies, definitely believes the Hornet is haunted. The other track field is spiking also. I can feel it. Quite a bit. When I first walked through the ship, I got sensations. We identified 28 different locations on the ship that were, you can consider hot spots, that's just kind of a euphemism for these are places where people had experiences more than once. Stash Murray claims to communicate telepathically with the Hornet's ghosts, 
including one who identified himself as the commanding officer. When I came aboard the ship, I encountered um, several spirits and several ghosts. One of the first spirits that I encountered was Admiral J.J. Clark. He once served on the ship in 1944, and several folks have encountered him. According to records previously unavailable to Stash Murray, J.J. Jocko Clark did serve aboard the Hornet. Other accounts indicate the late Admiral Clark, who was revered by his men for his loyalty and devotion, has appeared numerous times aboard the ship. On a Saturday morning before the museum was open and I was going below decks to uh, our main control, which is an engine room, and as I unchained, I noticed that there was an officer walking on the deck right below, coming around to go down the ladder. And this was four or five seconds until I went out of view. And then I came around and uh, looked down the ladder into the engine room and there was no one there. And uh, I can't explain it. I saw someone go down to that engine room. Clark is not alone aboard the ship. Stash Murray speculates that the Admiral might be joined by some of the 133 sailors who perished on the original Hornet. Lost souls returned from the deep. They came from the CV-8, which was the predecessor of the Hornet, which sunk and had a very tragic uh, loss of many lives. I encountered also many of um, other folks that had been on this ship at one point or another. It's a case where we have multiple witnesses sighting multiple ghosts, which is very unusual. And it seems like there are more ghosts all the time. So we have an expanding situation. We'd have to say that everything corroborates, all the stories come together. And we've got, in this case, people. Uh, you might call them dead people, but they are ghosts, spirits, consciousness, personalities, after death, whatever you want to call them, entities who are here. So why has a retired aircraft carrier become a favorite gathering place for dozens of ghosts? What I have noticed on the ship are what I call returned spirits. Whether they died on the ship or in civilian life, they've come by choice specifically to help on a mission. We think the ghosts are here to help the ship. I think they come back because when they were on this ship, it was a very exciting time in their life. They were young, they were full of life. Based upon the eyewitness accounts, it appears that the camaraderie of men in arms and the deadly drama of combat has turned the USS Hornet into a hub of supernatural events. Through more than 150 documented reports of ghostly events on board the Hornet, her former crew members have returned to immortalize both their love and devotion to a ship once known as the Grey Ghost. Next on In Search Of, could one sip of a sinister potion actually turn someone into a zombie? It may have happened to this man. Could it happen to you? Voodoo dolls, black magic, the living dead. Images from the darkest reaches of the supernatural so frightening that we exile them to the realm of myth. But one man's documented escape from his own burial and spellbound enslavement has forced skeptics and scientists alike to confront this reality. The undead may actually walk among us. The destination is Haiti, in search of zombies. This man's gentle demeanor hides a horrifying fact. He has dwelled in a hidden world of black magic, blood rituals, and secret societies. And 
he endured a nightmarish existence that few can imagine as a zombie. The world has long been fascinated by voodoo, a religion steeped in mystery and misunderstanding. In reality, this exotic fusion of tribal African rituals and Roman Catholic beliefs is both a positive and powerful force, a force capable of healing the sick and chasing away evil spirits. Most people practice voodoo for good, but some people also practice hoodoo, which is negative magic or sorcery. Zombification really is a form of capital punishment for, you know, people who have, you know, created um, upheaval or been very destructive in, you know, voodoo society. This process of zombification is a part from the religion of voodoo and all its beauty. It is a type of at least the darkest or the, the most wicked of mag black magic. A zombie by folk definition is the living dead. It's an individual who's had his or her soul stolen from them by sorcery in such a way that it brings on a state of apparent death, flinging them into a kind of perpetual purgatory, an uncertain fate, but a fate that is invariably said to be marked by enslavement. According to hoodoo legend, a person marked for punishment by a bokor or sorcerer is robbed of their soul, thus committing them to the ranks of the undead. It would be easy to dismiss such stories as mere superstition, for few people have ever met a zombie. Until now. This is the story of Clervius Narcisse, Zombie. This horrifying true story began with a mysterious illness. Haitian villager, Clervius Narcisse, had been admitted to Albert Schweitzer Hospital, complaining of a high fever and body aches. Two days later, he died and was promptly buried. This is the official death certificate for Clervius Narcisse, signed by two doctors, one of whom was an American. Years later, Clervius' sister was shopping in a local market in Port-au-Prince when a strange man approached her. He introduced himself using a childhood nickname known only to the Narcisse family. Though initially taken aback by this bizarre encounter, the young woman soon recognized the stranger. It was her brother, the late Clervius Narcisse. Coming up, had he risen from the grave? The shocking truth when we come back. It was the story that shocked the world. A Haitian villager whose death had been witnessed and certified by two physicians claimed that he had risen from the grave and been a zombie. It was well known that shortly before his death, Clervius Narcisse had been embroiled in numerous disputes with his brother and other members of their village. It is believed that these clashes provoked the wrath of a Bokor who then used black magic to turn Narcisse into a zombie. This process of creating a zombie is in retaliation for some wrong or some alleged wrong. Clarvius Narcisse describes his descent into the world of the undead. He heard everything when he was put in the coffin, when he was put in the grave, and he was showing you scar, a scar yeah. here. It was a nail from his coffin. When they bury the person, they put him in the grave, he's fully alive. He can see, he can hear, but he cannot talk and cannot move.
after his burial, Clervius was pulled from the grave by the magic of the Bokor. He claims he was one of 150 zombies who served as slaves on the sorcerer's plantation until his escape. His macabre tale spread like wildfire throughout the island of Haiti and eventually the world. But many questions remained. How could this man who was declared dead by two different doctors, then buried, return in seemingly perfect health? Dr. Wade Davis, a leading expert on zombies and author of the best-selling book, The Serpent and the Rainbow, was fascinated by this story. He traveled to Haiti in search of zombies and the secret of their creation. I was looking for something that could bring on the semblance of death so profoundly that it could fool a Western-trained physician such that the victim of the preparation uh, could be brought to the edge of death only to return to the realm of the living. Wondering what might cause the death-like state of people believed to be zombies, Davis used his contacts to obtain the Bacor's formula. He discovered that the ingredients were straight out of a witch's brew. Two freshly killed lizards, several plants, the carcass of a large toad, a puffer fish, and human bones. Though the Bacor considered the human bones to be the most potent part of this elixir, Wade Davis believed that the true culprit was the puffer fish. What makes them unique is that they have in their viscera and on the surface of their skin an extremely powerful neurotoxin called tetrodotoxin. Now this poison is seriously lethal. Davis and other scientists believe that, in small amounts, poison from the pufferfish would plunge someone into a trance-like state, rendering them a zombie. You know, it's black magic of the worst kind. I don't think anything could ever justify that, no more than taking a gun and blowing somebody's brains out for an alleged ill could ever be justified. Though Wade Davis made great strides in the effort to unlock the dark secrets of the zombie's creation, some still dispute his findings. For them, the shadowy world that separates medical fact from mystical legend and the living from the dead remains a mystery. Thanks for watching In Search Of. I'm Mitch Pileggi. Good night. The following program deals with a controversial subject. The theories expressed are not the only possible interpretation. Viewers are invited to make a judgment based on all available information. This program contains images which may be disturbing to younger or sensitive viewers. Parental discretion is advised. Tonight on In Search Of, Rosalia Lombardo may be the prettiest girl in Palermo, but her lasting beauty remains a mystery. She's been dead for 80 years and she's just one of the 8,000 catacomb mummies. Bigfoot, as it's called in the United States, is an animal to fear and dread. This Oregon psychologist thought Bigfoot was only a legend until his wife and children strayed into the monster's path. I was in absolute terror. This thing was about 50 feet from my wife and my children. Why has this devil taken up residence in a French Catholic church? It's an occult mystery of sex, money, and murder. And you can't ignore these earthquake forecasters. Your life may depend on their predictions. I'm Mitch Pileggi, and this is In Search Of.
Death rites are among the most sacred traditions in any culture. From the serene to the ghoulish, the treatment of the dead offers a unique glimpse into the soul of the living. For those brave enough to visit one of the most shocking places on earth, there are the catacombs of Palermo, Sicily. Deep underground, you can look four centuries of death straight in the face. The secret used to preserve some of the dead in haunting perfection has never been revealed. In search of that secret, we travel to the terrifying lair of the catacomb mummies. This island is still steeped in old world traditions, and the rituals of Sicilian funerals are the same as they have been for generations. The various ways to honor the dead are a part of what makes Sicily unique, from the traditional to the macabre. For underneath this popular vacation spot exists a horrific museum of the dead. The visual impact that the catacombs offer is indeed immediate and profound because one comes in direct contact with the dead bodies, which is something that does not happen in regular cemeteries. The Capuchin catacombs are named after the order of the Capuchin monks, who have guarded this final resting place for more than five centuries. Those who descend into the catacombs are overwhelmed by the nightmarish sight of hundreds of dead bodies, dressed in their finery, lining the walls of the dimly lit corridors. Their faces contorted in a chilling variety of ways. Time and gravity have caused some of the corpses to appear as if they are screaming to the living. We have historical sources telling us that some of the dead spoke to the friars, asking them to pray for their souls. There are over 8,000 dead inhabiting the Capuchin catacombs. The first person to be displayed here was Brother Silvestro da Gubbio, who died in 1599. Considered a holy man, his fellow monks embalmed da Gubbio so that the congregation could pray to him after his death. What began as a tomb for the Capuchin Brotherhood in the 16th century later became an exclusive burial place for wealthy citizens, war heroes, and prominent artisans. To be mummified within the catacombs became a status symbol. Little is known about the life of Bartolomeo Mena, but in death, his unusual size and broad shoulders has earned him the nickname of the giant. Even though French Colonel Enya Di Giuliano died in 1848, his French Bourbon uniform is preserved to this day. American Vice Consul Giovanni Petroniti passed away in 1911 and is also immortalized here. A corridor of the virgins was specially reserved for unmarried women, whose virtue was revered. Here the maidens lie in open coffins, elegantly clad in colorful dresses. Delicate lace bonnets eerily frame their exposed skulls. Originally, corpses were simply placed in the Mediterranean sun to dry naturally, but later, the monks began to experiment with chemicals to find better ways to preserve the dead. One method for preserving the bodies was to immerse them in an arsenic bath. This way the dead person retained all of his or her features, even skin tone, hair and beards. Arsenic, a deadly poison, proved to be a very effective embalming agent preserving the dead to a remarkable degree and allowing relatives of the deceased a better chance to relive their memories. In this place, one could witness the greatest dramas of life, the joys and the sorrows of the living, the fond remembrance of lost loved ones, especially those who had been taken from life much too soon. The greatest emotion was and is still created by the little girl Rosalia Lombardo. The preservation of Rosalia Lombardo 
is the Capuchin's crowning achievement. Her tiny body lies in a special children's chapel. In 1920, little Rosalia was only two years old when she died. She was the first child of a Sicilian family and was naturally adored by her parents. Her death at such a tender young age was a heartbreaking tragedy in the community. An eminent local physician, Dr. Solafia, experimented with a unique embalming method based on a secret combination of chemicals that were injected into the lifeless body of the child. The results were remarkable. La bambina. It's as if in her face were summed up the entire drama of human existence, our desire for life that is sooner or later cut down by the unavoidable law of death. Rosalia's family must have felt a great deal of comfort mixed with sadness in visiting their daughter in the catacombs. A family tradition began when the Lombardos brought Rosalia's sister to the catacombs to pay her respects. She would continue to visit throughout her life, and while she naturally aged, her older sister Rosalia remained frozen in time, looking exactly the same today as she did more than 80 years ago. For reasons known only to him, Dr. Sola Fia took the secret of his embalming method to his grave. We don't know much about the method used to preserve her body, except that it involved chemicals and herbs. You can see on her body the ointments used, which kept her flesh moist and perfectly preserved her every feature, even her hair and her skin tone. There is some speculation that after his success with Rosalia, Dr. Solafia shared some of his expertise with the team of Russians responsible for embalming their leader, Lenin, with equally lifelike results. This is what Rosalia should look like after being ravished by time and the elements. But instead, for nearly a century, she gives onlookers the illusion that she is only taking a momentary rest. This unusual burial place was written about by an Italian poet, Ippolito Pindamonte, who visited in 1777. Wide, dark, underground rooms where bodies without souls still go around, dressed as they were when they died. Their ancient features, their flesh, and even their faces are kept after a hundred years or more. Death looks at them, and fears she has failed in her aim. There is certainly nothing attractive about death, but it is the terror and the unease which death inspires that draws people to the Capuchin catacombs. Long after the rest of us have returned to the soil, this testament to the mysterious skills of a simple Sicilian doctor will live on as the sleeping beauty of Palermo. Coming up, what secret could be so shocking that it would drive a priest into the arms of the devil? It was something incredibly shattering to his own belief system. And earthquake predictors sound the alarm. I've made more than 400 predictions and hit more than 300 of them. But first, it's man against monster when we go hunting for Bigfoot. Oh, there you go. Imagine this. You're out in the woods on a picnic with your family when a strange howl splits the silence. You're in Bigfoot country, and there's no one to protect you. For Dr. Matthew Johnson, this scenario was all too real. Like most of us, he thought this man-beast lived only in legend until he came face to face with the nine-foot monster that left this footprint. It 
we were totally um, unaware of what this animal is like, what it would do, what it was capable of. Bigfoot, as it's called in the United States, is an animal to fear and dread. My body slammed immediately into the fight or flight response mode. Oh, there you go. Powerful, intelligent, and skilled at survival. The creature bears the name Bigfoot. Stories of violence and death sometimes follow its appearance. Other reports say its true nature is kind and peaceful. It is a fact that real or imagined sightings have occurred thousands of times in the past 150 years. But the nature of Bigfoot remains a mystery. It might be a primitive human or a throwback survivor of an animal species long thought extinct. In recent years, there have been hundreds of sightings of a creature that fits its description, centered in the thickly wooded landscape of the Pacific Northwest. There are things out here in this world that we don't understand, and if we think we know it all, um, I think we're practicing um, arrogance as a human species. Dr. Matthew Johnson is a licensed clinical psychologist with a private practice in Grants Pass, Oregon. He has risked public ridicule to share his amazing story. On July 1st, 2000, Dr. Johnson, his wife Rochelle, and their three children were enjoying a long hike along a remote wilderness trail near the Oregon caves. We hiked up the mountain about a mile and we came across a stretch about 50 to 100 feet on the trail where we were downwind of something that um, smelled horrible and we didn't talk about it. In my mind, I thought, well, I wonder if this is a skunk. So we kept going probably another oh, 10 or 15 minutes and we started hearing this noise. In my mind, I kept going over and over, what could this be? So we kept walking along the trail and this sound continued and we all stopped and I looked at my wife and kids and I said, did you guys just hear what I heard? And they nodded their heads and said, you know, yes. We kept going a little bit further and Matt needed to stop. He was feeling a need to use the bushes. So he went up there and while he was doing that, we just were kind of looking on the trail and finding different bugs running around, which we often do when we're hiking. I was scanning the trees from my right to my left and all of a sudden I caught movement out of the left corner of my eye and I turned my head and I saw Bigfoot walking from one tree to another, it took about two seconds, peeked its head out from behind the tree, and it was watching my wife and kids down on the path over here. Everything I knew about the outdoors came crashing down, and um, I was in absolute terror. This thing was about 50 feet from my wife and my children, and all my, um, my protective instincts kicked in. I ran down to the trail, and I um, just said, let's go, let's go now. Everything happened so fast, but if you watch some of those movies where something really traumatic is happening, it goes so slow. What I saw was approximately eight to nine feet tall. It walked with large strides, swinging its arms. I sat the kids down, gave them some water out of the backpack, pulled my wife aside and said, you're not gonna believe what I saw, but I saw a Bigfoot. She said, I believe you. It all made sense because of the smell, because of the sound that we'd heard, and it was so unusual. And I think just if it had just been Matt and I, it would have been different. We would have probably panicked more, actually, because we had to stay calm and not frighten the kids, although we were, you know, very scared. The Sasquatch, or Bigfoot, as it's called in the United States, is an animal to fear and dread. Tom Steenberg has spent the past 21 years on a self-proclaimed quest for the undeniable proof of the existence of Bigfoot. Since the turn of the century, I've known of no account where someone has reported actually being attacked by one. However, it is an animal, and all animals are really unpredictable. And we do have people who disappear in wilderness areas every year, and I, I tend if you, to believe if you ran into a hostile Sasquatch, you would tend to disappear. While many believe that Bigfoot roams the Pacific Northwest, there is still debate as to the origin and species of the creature. The whole idea that Bigfoot is a missing link that's really wrong-headed. 
Lauren Coleman is a leading cryptozoologist. His field of study is hidden and mysterious animals. These creatures were here at the same time we were. They probably evolved from different kinds of apes than we did. And so uh, there's a parallel evolution going on here. We're cousins. We're not uh, direct descendants of Bigfoot. There are various theories. One is that Paranthropus, a robust sort of anthropoid type humanoid, existed and is still exists today. Some people, though, think that it was Giganthopithecus, which is a giant ape from the Himalayas, from India, that migrated across the Bering Straits and is into the United States and Canada. Most experts who study Bigfoot do so from a distance by examining footprints and fossil records. But there are Bigfoot trackers who will put themselves in harm's way, and Paul Freeman is a legend amongst them. He has captured astonishing video evidence of his encounter with Bigfoot in the northwest corner of Oregon. That one particular morning, I got in there real late, and there was their tracks in the mud where they'd been drinking water. It was August 20th, 1992, and Paul was finding footprints, dozens of them, all over Deduct Creek. Yeah, it looks like they've been here. It looks like he's pretty fresh. I'm around this bush here. Oh, he's come down and went back up bow. Paul Freeman knew he was close. But this old trail, can't see much up through here. Got to be tracks here somewhere in this road. Look at that. I hear the brush popping and stuff. Oh, there he goes. I hear my heart beating 40 miles an hour. The images that Paul Freeman had captured that day on videotape set the scientific world on fire. Dr. Jeff Meldrum is an associate professor of anatomy at Idaho State University. Here are some of the reasons I think this video is worthy of, of further consideration. Oh, there you one of the things is the proportions of the, of the arms. We can see here as the arm swings back that the forearm is, is really quite long, disproportionately long, which suggests it's not just simply a man in a fur costume. And in fact, the, the way in which the head sits upon the shoulders is, is not very human looking. Dr. Meldrum's area of expertise is foot anatomy and he has done extensive research on the tracks believed to have been left by Bigfoot. Most impressive to me is this set of uh, seven casts from a single incident that I experienced firsthand and cast these myself. And they show a variety, uh, show the variation that can appear in the footprints from you know, a full, rather passive footprint, the toes clearly visible, to much deeper impressions as the animal was running down across a, a fallow field. I remember the first time looking at the long line of footprints in the ground and, and realizing those features. Um, literally the hair sort of stood up on the back of my neck because I realized that uh, in all likelihood an animal walked right past here that, uh, that we don't fully comprehend or recognize. Even with today's modern forensic science, the proof of Bigfoot's existence will be left up to the hunters. Well, the only type of evidence that will be accepted by the scientific community is hard physical evidence, and what they mean by that is they need a body or piece of the body. Nothing else will do. I'd like for somebody to find a skeleton. I'd like for somebody to find a dead body. My theory is that Bigfoot will be discovered when a lumber truck hits it, and that it, then we'll know it's real. Could I shoot one if I had one of my rifle sights? I don't know. I really don't. I mean, I don't, I don't even know if I actually saw one. Even after all this time, I would believe my eyes. I mean, seven, eight foot, hair covered man like creature in her own backyard, mind boggling. Would I shoot it? In order to get the evidence, in order to prove this animal exists, it'd have to. Until such proof is brought forth, Bigfoot remains a threat, and the evidence of its existence 
should serve as a warning to those who venture into the vast wilderness. Later on In Search Of, can deadly quakes be predicted? What would you do? Would you go to school? Would you go to work? Would you keep your kids home? Brace yourself for this earth-shaking story. But first, a priest's shocking discovery hurdles him into the world of the occult when we come back. The life of a humble priest mysteriously changes. Suddenly, wealthy beyond words, he plunges into the occult and a dark world of secret societies and murder. The strange monuments he built in life and his cryptic final confession spark controversy to this day. In search of his secret, we travel to a bizarre church. I'm in Rennes Chateau, France, in one of the oddest churches in Europe, perhaps the world. Boyd Rice is an author and researcher into the mystery of Rennes Chateau. At the end of the 19th century, there was a parish priest named Berger Saunier who was redecorating his church here, and he made a discovery in this Visigothic pillar. While working in the church, Saunier removed a crumbling piece of the altar discovering a secret compartment that contained parchments. Whatever Saunier discovered here was something very shocking. It was something incredibly shattering to his own belief system as, as a man who had been raised a devout Catholic and trained from the priesthood. And in those days, of course, uh, uh, they had to keep this information so secret, because otherwise they would be killed. Many experts believe that the papers contain shocking proof that Jesus Christ did not die on the cross, a notion blasphemous to most Christians. The young priest took his discovery to church authorities in Paris. When he returned, he said nothing of the parchments or their possible meaning. However, he began spending enormous amounts of money, the source of which was unknown. Virtually overnight, he began living in a very kingly fashion. He spent millions of dollars building the buildings around here, redecorating the chapel. It's my belief that he was paid off by the Catholic Church. The secret was so important that the Catholic Church actually paid a huge amount of money to keep him quiet. Was Sonier blackmailing the church with information that could ultimately destroy it? According to some, his bizarre renovations to the church indicate that this may be true. The last of the Stations of the Cross shows the traditional image of Christ's body being put into the tomb. But there is a full moon in the painting, and the Gospels state that Christ was put into the tomb during the day. And why does it depict this scene happening in the middle of the night? Uh, is it that someone is spiriting Jesus' body out of the tomb because he, in fact, is not dead yet? If Jesus Christ did not die on the cross, the key to what he did with the rest of his life lies in the figure of Mary Magdalene. She was a devoted follower of Christ, but some believe they may have had a more intimate relationship. Many people believe that Mary Magdalene came here to the Languedoc region of France and had a dynasty of kings who were the offspring of Christ. These people became kings throughout Europe. They became monarchs of the world. If his bloodline existed today, well, wouldn't that be the real authority, the real Christian church? So, you know, presumably there would have been a rivalry between the two. Some researchers believe that these descendants of Christ ruled Europe for a thousand years until the Catholic Church succeeded in a campaign to eliminate them from power. 
If the Catholic Church had purchased Sonier's silence about the line of kings descended from Christ, the priest's next renovation seems to be a calculated attempt to offend the church. According to Boyd Rice, this very strange statue beside the main altar projects the image of Christ as a father holding his own baby, suggesting that this child was the beginning of his royal dynasty. He knew that uh, it was too much uh, for people at that time to understand. He was playing a game where people in the future, with more open minds, could click into symbolism. The secret that Sonier kept hidden seemed to undermine his fate. When we come back, Father Sonier plunges into the world of the occult. This program contains images which may be disturbing to younger or sensitive viewers. Parental discretion is advised. A French priest finds an ancient scroll hidden in this church. What was the shocking truth behind his discovery? Had Jesus Christ survived the crucifixion and fathered a royal dynasty? It seems that Father Béranger Saunier's discovery led him to lose his faith, and he began to deny his priestly vows by immersing himself in the occult. If he found evidence that Jesus didn't die on the cross or that he was married to Mary Magdalene and had children, you, know, you could see where this would rock his world could be he went through some sort of spiritual crisis. And these, other, these occult groups have, take advantage. It is believed that Sonier is initiated into the occult group, and that soon after, he takes another critical step in his journey towards scandal and blasphemy. He starts having a relationship, even though he's a priest, he starts having a probably sexual relationship with this opera singer named Emma Calve, who was very, very famous at the time and also member of these occult groups. Sonier soon commissions bizarre renovations that may reflect Emma Calvé's influence and his involvement with the black arts. A grotesque demon with bulging eyes, devil horns, and a horrified expression is installed by Sonier to stand guard at the entrance of the church. And he also inscribed in Latin over the entrance uh, the Latin words for this place is terrible, which seems an odd thing for a priest to put on the entrance to his own church. Some accounts indicate that Sonier's descent into decadence is rapid. He constructs the Via Bethania, a lavish private residence where he enjoys frequent visits from the intoxicating Emma Calve. She continues to weave her irresistible occult spell Sonier's vow of chastity is now a memory. Sonier begins to host wild parties. It's here that Sonier possibly meets with the living descendants of Jesus Christ. Many believe that the occult societies were hiding and protecting these royal heirs as they waited for their chance to rule once again. The atmosphere around Rennes-le-Chateau begins to turn ominous. Father Antoine Gélise was one of Saunier's closest associates. Some believe that relations between the priests had become strained. On All Saints' Eve, November 1st, 1897, Father Gélise was reading in his room when he was attacked with an axe and brutally murdered. In a ritual practice common to those trained by the church, the assassin folded the dead priest's arms across his chest. A veil of suspicion fell over Sonier. The murder would remain unsolved. After the murder of Father Gélise, Sonier begins to spend more time alone, and he builds one of his last projects. On the edge of a cliff, he constructs the Tower of Magdalene. And it is in this tower on the 17th of January, 1917, 
that Sonier is paid a visit by two strangers. Hours later, he is found unconscious on the floor. Doctors called it a stroke. Oddly enough, the church housekeeper had ordered a coffin for him the week prior. Fearing that the end is near, Sonier asked that an old friend, Father Riviere, give him the last rites and hear his confession. Father Riviere was shocked at what was revealed and refused to grant his friend absolution. Two days later, Father Berenger Sonier passes from the mortal realm and is later buried on the grounds at Rennes-le-Chateau. What did Sonier confess on his deathbed that so horrified Father Riviere? Was it Sonier's blasphemous involvement with the occult? Did Sonier admit knowledge of the heinous and barbaric murder of fellow priest Antoine Gelis? Or did Sonier shake Father Riviere's faith by sharing the secret that led Sonier down his own dark path? When Beranger Sonier slipped into the deathly silence of the grave, he left no answers. Only clues that continue to haunt many whom are in search of the mystery of Rennes le Chateau. Next on In Search Of. Imagine knowing where and when the next killer earthquake will strike. What these experts have uncovered could save thousands of lives. In under a minute, a large earthquake can wreak more destruction than a hurricane or flood. Even a moment's notice could spell the difference between life and death. But there is no way to predict when the next seismic catastrophe will strike. Or is there? Some people claim that their warnings have been kept under wraps. I think that people are afraid of panicking people. Who knows how people would react? What would you do? Would you go to school? Would you go to work? Would you keep your kids home? Would you keep your husband or your wife home? In the last 26 years, I've made more than 400 predictions and hit more than 300 of them. Earthquakes strike with fatal and devastating force. Recently, the world has watched in horror as over 18,000 people died in India as the result of a calamitous 7.7 .7 earthquake. In Turkey, entire cities were leveled as more than 17,000 people perished beneath the rubble of a 7.4 earthquake. Able to strike at any time and anywhere, the unpredictability of earthquakes leaves us all vulnerable. People should understand that they are not going to know when earthquakes are going to happen. David Jackson is the former science director for the Southern California Earthquake Center. Earthquakes can't be predicted because they're way too complex. They result from a lot of forces that vary from one place to another. We can't measure these forces in detail because earthquakes occur at a depth of 5 to 10 miles um, below the surface of the Earth. Like David Jackson, geologist Jim Birkeland once believed that earthquake prediction was impossible until he made a startling observation. We had the three major tide raising forces occurring almost simultaneously, lining up with the sun, moon, and earth, nearness of the moon, and nearness of the sun. So it just popped into my head at that point. Perhaps the solid earth is also being pulled out by this gravitational stress. Well, two days later, we got a 4.4 quake. And I thought, my, this is simple. What is so tough about predicting quakes? In 1989, Brooklyn made a series of very troubling observations. Not only do we have the highest tides in three years, we have animals doing very, very strange things in the Bay Area. Never before had live beaked whales washed up on the beaches here. So I had called the paper four days before the World Series quake and said, it's going to be worse than I thought. Good 
corner of Jefferson and Divisadero. The downtown section of Santa Cruz is basically gone. You can see this building is collapsed. Right at the end of the cantilever is where the roadway dropped onto the lower deck. Jim Berkland's dire prediction was ignored by the scientific community. A massive 7.1 earthquake hit San Francisco, causing billions of dollars in damage. Motorists were trapped beneath collapsed freeways, and lives were lost in the tragedy. One week after predicting the San Francisco earthquake, Berkland was suspended from his job as county geologist and warned not to make any more predictions. They've called me a clown, a crackpot, uh, an enthusiast, not a scientist. And I says, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing because I believe in it. It's helping people. Using his method of studying the tides, moon, and gravitational forces, Jim Berkland claims to have successfully predicted over 300 earthquakes. Professional screenwriter Kathy Gorey is another person with demonstrated abilities to predict the coming of earthquakes. But unlike Jim Berkland, she is not looking for signals. They come to her, whether she likes it or not. I get a headache before an earthquake. Um, the headache is centered right in the frontal lobe. Um, that's how I can tell. I don't normally get headaches. I don't have migraines. I'm not someone with a history of headaches, so that's how I noticed this. I would have a headache. It would last for however long it lasted, correlated with the magnitude of the quake. Then after the end of the headache, within usually a few hours, maybe up to 24, 48 hours, there would be an earthquake. On January 14th, 1994, Gory began to experience an excruciating headache that would not subside. I was complaining about the headache. I was joking because we had a, a lot of pressure on us to finish a script. We were supposed to turn the script in the next day. I said, oh, this is giving me such a headache. And one of my friends said, maybe, have you ever thought it might be one of your earthquake headaches? Within hours, Kathy and her friends were jolted out of their beds by the devastating earthquake that leveled parts of Northridge, California and set portions of the city of Los Angeles on fire. Kathy Gorey attributes her headache to a mineral called magnetite. We know that animals behave strangely before a quake. Their navigation systems are off. And it's due to the fact that the magnetite in their brains is sensitive to the electromagnetic waves that are being released. And for a long time, they thought human beings didn't have magnetite in their brains. And about 10 years ago, there was an article in Time magazine showing that, lo and behold, yes, we do. We do have magnetite, all humans have it, and it's centered in the frontal lobe of the brain. Kathy Gorey may be living proof that certain people, like animals, can tune into the Earth's subtle changes to forecast an impending earthquake. But the surest way to predict earthquakes may be the most bizarre method of all. You won't believe how this scientist makes his predictions. We'll show you when we come back. While most government agencies believe that earthquake prediction is not possible, there are those who disagree, claiming that their abilities to forecast earthquakes could save countless lives. Scientist Zhang Hao Xiao is among them. After over a decade of research, Xiao has refined his methods and claims an astonishing rate of accuracy. His secret is in the clouds. Every day I spend observing satellite photographs, looking for earthquake clouds that appear suddenly. These clouds are different from weather clouds because they are formed by water vapor that is emitted from the Earth. This vapor condenses into an earthquake cloud, which looks like a very long, thin line, or several parallel radiating lines. Recently, a series of troubling earthquake clouds began appearing in the skies above the American Northwest. The unusual formations prompted Zhang Hao Xiao to post an internet warning. On February 26th of this year, I found a sign that there would be an earthquake of magnitude greater than five in the Seattle area. Okay. 
Zhang Haoxiao was right. A mere 40 hours after his startling prediction, Seattle, Washington was rocked by a magnitude 6.8 earthquake. When the dust settled, many were amazed that Zhang Haoxiao had been able to predict a massive earthquake for an area of the United States that hadn't experienced one in almost 40 years. The scientist always registers his predictions with the United States Geological Survey. Their own records indicate that Zhang Haoxiao has been right almost 30% of the time. Yet they are still unwilling to admit that earthquake prediction is possible. Then on the 20th of Even March, if authorities could predict earthquakes, some still wonder if they would release their information. I think that people are afraid of panicking people. You don't want to have war of the world or some kind of crazy thing happening. I think seismologists are scared of predicting earthquakes because of the huge responsibility they would have to bear. Three people with nothing in common but an uncanny ability to defy the critics who still insist that earthquake prediction is a mere matter of coincidence. Every time there seems to be a correlation, um, the critics come out and say, coincidence, but when it keeps happening time after time over 26 years, it's more than coincidence. Are we truly helpless in the face of this terrifying power? Or can the emerging science of earthquake prediction provide warning and defense against the next cataclysm? The truth remains elusive. Until we have answers, our very survival depends on chance, readiness, and a future as uncertain as the ground beneath our feet. Thanks for watching In Search Of. I'm Mitch Pileggi. Good night. The following program deals with a controversial subject. The theories expressed are not the only possible interpretation. Viewers are invited to make a judgment based on all available information. This program contains images which may be disturbing to younger or sensitive viewers. Parental discretion is advised. Tonight on In Search Of. Spirits of the Old South rise from the grave. No one rests in peace on these haunted plantations. And scientists claim that alien microbes may be headed our way. Will our own space program bring a doomsday virus to Earth? Evil has many faces, but none strike fear like the one we know as Satan. Does Lucifer rule in hell? Or is he lurking among us right now? We'll go in search of the devil. We are your children. And caught in the crosshairs, this beautiful young woman has no place to hide. An easy target for psychic spies. I'm Mitch Pileggi, and this is In Search Of. The lush plantations of the American South stand as monuments to an era marked by beauty and brutality. With this troubled legacy, 
It is no surprise that these grand estates are rumored to play host to frightening displays of paranormal activity. This story takes us to the heart of Dixie in search of haunted plantations. Louisiana, home of splendid plantations, southern hospitality, and gracious living, is also home to something more. I never believed in ghosts before, but it's, I saw something. You can sense that, you know, you're not alone. I still can't explain what I've seen other than tell you I know it's not something natural. Oak Alley and the Myrtles are two of the region's finest plantations. They hearken back to an era of grace and opulence that once made Louisiana the jewel of the South. Today, these rooms stand as silent reminders of that time. Beautiful, well-tended, and apparently empty. But many claim the plantations are inhabited by ghosts. Caretakers and frightened tourists alike have reported mysterious episodes reflecting the mansion's dark pasts. We have had a few guests that have left us before the evening was over for one reason or another. The ghostly encounters mark a blood-stained history of slavery, tragedy, and murder. There are ghosts that can wreak havoc in one's life. There's been cases where ghosts have attacked people. There are cases, uh, you know, not, not only psychic attacks, but physical attacks. Oak Alley is aptly named for its 28 majestic live oaks. The lush canopy they create has been featured in several movies, including the Anne Rice thriller, Interview with a Vampire. Not all of Oak Alley's shadows, however, are cast by its famous trees. There are apparently some spirits of some type that are still in this house that haven't been settled for some reason, and they're still lingering around. Oak Alley's mystical locale attracts tourists from around the world. As a tour guide, Andre Jacobs has been a witness to the alarming reactions from anxious sightseers. There's a place upstairs which was sometimes used as a guest room, sick room, or even a mourning room for funerals, where some of the young ladies have approached that area, seem to not be able to catch their breath. There's something affecting them. They, you know, some of them have even felt like something was actually strangling them at that moment, and they just have to walk away from the tour. Andre will never forget his own chilling supernatural encounter. I was only here about two months when I was sitting upstairs waiting for a tour to come up to me. I was getting bored and uh, decided to look downstairs to see if one of the ladies was down there for me to talk to. Well, I didn't see them, but as I looked down, there was an image of a girl in a white dress. Of course, I turned away right away, thinking, well, it must be the light from underneath the floor reflecting into my eyes. Well, about 10 minutes later, there it was again. For about two hours, I was shaking. It's like I couldn't shake it off. It just uh, affected me in that way. A possible rationalization for the incident only added to Andre's terror. One of the ladies, uh, well, in a joking way, was uh, telling me one day, well, you know, you dressed up here as the uh, plantation owner. The little girl may have thought you were her father. And that sort of shook me that day. It did give me a strange feeling. I've never forgotten that. It is believed that the ghost was that of a girl who died mysteriously on the third floor of the mansion in the 1800s. Petey Dugas was giving a tour when she and her group encountered a paranormal force. I had just come out of the living room with about 35 people. And as they walked into the dining room, a candle fell off a candlestick onto the table. I thought nothing of it. I thought it was just the people walking into the room and the vibration of closing the doors. A gentleman was standing right by. He put the candlestick back in the candle holder. Thought nothing of it. I went on to the opposite end of the room, started talking like I usually do. And all of a sudden, that same candle flew halfway across the room, landed on the floor. Everybody stayed with their mouth open. They were just shocked. There are no records to explain the source of this bizarre activity, and the history of Oak Alley remains shrouded in the past. But this is not the only haunted plantation. Some 90 miles away along the Mississippi River is the Myrtles. In 1796, this stately plantation was built with the sweat of slave labor. Today, 
it is a bed and breakfast, one which promises anything but a good night's rest. A lot of times guests are awoke by a child's cry. Tour director Hester Eby has worked at the most haunted place in America for the past 16 years. When I first started working here, I said, oh yeah, you know, this is just something that, that's said. But after working for about two weeks or so, doors opening that you know you've locked, or you can sense someone around even though you can't see them. You just feel like if I should turn around right now, someone is right behind me. I would be right in their face. You'd hear the footsteps, you'd hear the door open and close, and you could just feel them. I felt them like standing over the bed looking at us. They were checking us out. Paranormal investigator Kalila Smith led several group examinations of the Myrtles. Rudy Raven is a member of Smith's crew. I've experienced things that basically like, you know, basically drop your equipment and run out the door. These ghost hunters use state-of-the-art equipment to document many of their findings. We use a lot of uh, regular 35 millimeter film, uh, infrared film. Uh, we had night vision on the digital cameras. I'm freezing. I'm covered with chills right now. Something's on me right now. Whoa, did you see something just fly by? Whoa, there it is again. Watch. All right, we've got activity in here. You feel how cold it's getting? We brought in uh, non-contact thermometers. We started picking up temperatures going down below 60 degrees, which is highly unusual. 57 degrees. It's 57 degrees in this one spot over here. Also, the windows were covered with frost just in these two rooms. Oh, this thing's going crazy. Y'all ought to see this. Look at this. It's, it jumped back up to, it's going to 68 to 75, 83. We started hearing voices like whispering, door slamming shut handprints appearing on the mirrors. We try wiping them off, it does not wipe off. Heard some knocking and some low voices, and uh, we also heard the crystals on the chandelier clinking together. This chandelier hangs in a bedchamber known as the voodoo room. A little girl once spent her last days here, dying of yellow fever. In an effort to cure their daughter, where doctors couldn't help, they brought in a voodoo priestess to do a ritual for her in hopes of healing her. Now, unfortunately, the child died. As penance for not being able to heal her, they hung the voodoo priestess from the chandelier. Some guests have went so far to say that they've got a bit warm in the voodoo room, pull their covers back, wake an hour or so later, and be tucked in tightly. And of course, they were not happy, so they did leave us before their evening was over. E.B. recounts the plantation's tragic history. In the early 1820s, Judge Clark Woodruff was the owner. He had married the first owner's daughter, General David Bradford's daughter, Sarah. And supposedly, through the time that they were together, Judge Woodruff also took on a mistress, who was one of his house servants. That house servant was Chloe, a young slave girl with an unfortunate habit. She was caught eavesdropping on some of the family business, and she had been forewarned about eavesdropping. Her punishment was swift and harsh. The judge was upset. He ordered her left ear to be removed. He then stripped Chloe of her household duties and sentenced her back to the slave quarters. In reply, she baked the birthday cake for his oldest daughter and said to have used the juices from the oleander leaf. It let off a liquid very similar to arsenic. She thought if she made the children ill, she'd be able to prove that she was the person to take care of them, and then she would be brought back into the household. But Chloe's foolish plan took a tragic twist. The judge's wife and two daughters died, and the servant girl paid the ultimate price. Chloe was hung by an angry mob and then thrown in the river. But many insist that Chloe remains imprisoned on the plantation and offer proof for their assertions. This photo was taken by proprietor Tita Moss. Along with the shapes of two children on the roof, Chloe herself can be seen hanging in the trees. I got a photograph right behind the sofa where they said the children were seen a lot, the two little girls, and there was some misty fog back there. But why are the plantations possessed with their slain inhabitants? What is the reason for the tormenting poltergeist activity? Well, you've got a large amount of murders. You had like 10 murders here, and that's a lot in a very, very small concentrated area. Also, this property was originally acquired by uh, General William Bradford, and it was believed to be Indian burial ground. But the graves were located on the site where Bradford wanted to build his house. So the general callously exhumed and burned the Indian remains. I think that's where it all began with the Myrtles, and it just 
kind of domino effect it after that. The dominoes finally stopped falling in 1920 when the Myrtle's overseer was brutally robbed and stabbed to death on the property. The killer was never found, and to this day, the crime remains unsolved. These were untimely deaths. They were unjust deaths. There was a lot of strong emotion behind these deaths. So that sort of sets the stage for the spirit to hang around a little bit. And any time you come in and uns unsettle that and, and tamper with that. The spirits tend to get a little upset over that. Skeptics believe the spooky occurrences are nothing more than the mind playing tricks, a billowing curtain or odd reflection of light. But the cynicism doesn't fly with the local folk. For them, the haunting spirits of the plantations are very real and here to stay. I believe that they're here, and I don't have to see them. They don't have to prove themselves to me. I can sense it. Coming up, is someone you know in service to Satan? Hail Satan. And government spies use telepathy to zero in on human targets. But first, Micro-invaders threaten the human race. It could unleash a pandemic of uh, biblical proportions and otherwise uh, destroy Earth's delicate ecosystems. Are we ready to fight? One of our deadliest enemies is making a comeback, and we may be in for the fight of our lives. More lethal than bullets, tiny microbes can strike the human body, overriding all defenses and leaving death in their wake. These killer bacteria may crawl out of the jungle, breed in the test tubes of a terrorist laboratory, or even, some say, arrive here from the deepest reaches of outer space. There is no immunity from the doomsday virus. We look to the stars and the exploration of outer space for answers to mankind's deepest questions and the solutions to our biggest problems. But could our hunger for information about these distant worlds bring about our downfall? Science writer Barry DiGregorio is co-author of Mars, The Living Planet. The threat of Mars sample return mission is bringing back an organism from the surface of Mars that we have no idea how to deal with here on the, this planet. We are basically going to have a cannonball filled with Martian soil come back from the surface of Mars, enter the Earth's atmosphere without a parachute, and impact somewhere in the Utah desert where it will be taken to a level four biohazard containment facility. De Gregorio's fear, which is shared by others, is that the Martian soil samples will contain an alien microbe, a virus that will wreak apocalyptic destruction on an unsuspecting Earth. One of the scientists on the Viking mission in 1976 has, for the last 26 years, said that the surface of Mars contained life. That scientist is Dr. Gilbert Levin, he was chosen by NASA to be part of the mission's biology team and now heads the bioresearch group Spherix. Some people look on the risk of returning a sample from Mars as infinitely small. Well, let's even say that it is very, very small. We have only one Earth. We don't know much about what those organisms on the surface of Mars could do potentially to Earth's ecosystems. The fears of DiGregorio and Levin have their basis in fact. The Earth is already the victim of a devastating virus of unknown origin, the Ebola virus. Ebola is a very lethal, acute, infectious disease. Dr. C.J. Peters is the former head of special pathogens for the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia. 
Ebola virus causes people to die, and the epidemics have had mortality rates around 90% for the most serious strain. Deadlier and more contagious than the AIDS virus, this malevolent and mysterious microbe first surfaced in the country of Zaire and has terrorized the African continent ever since. It showed up in 1976. It caused two major epidemics, and then it disappeared. And it was essentially gone, except for the Kikwit episode in 89, until it came back in 1995, and it caused a, a Massive epidemic. The cruelest of killers, it tortures its victims until they succumb to a gruesome death. So you essentially die the death of a thousand cuts. You have small deaths all over your body, in fact, afflicting all your organs. This insidious disease, found in tissue, body fluids, and even tears, is undetectable in its early stages. And once it makes its presence known, it's too late for the victims. We have no treatment. We cannot give a drug that will inhibit the growth of the virus and stop it from causing all the problems that it does. Where did this organism come from? Scientists have no answers, only questions. It belongs to a virus family that we just don't understand. We don't know what its natural reservoir is. We don't understand its own economy, how it gets from one day to the next and spreads from uh, uh, animal to animal. And we don't understand how it infects people. Ebola's past may be an unsolved mystery, but there's nothing mysterious about its future. We know that Ebola infects humans. Those humans can get on a plane, fly directly to the US, and develop the disease. They may not even know they've been exposed. Is Ebola a harbinger of things to come once the Mars soil samples return? Do we dare risk importing microbes from an unknown world? Dr. Ross McVie, of the American Museum of Natural History has been studying the disappearance, the extinction of the mammals during the Pleistocene era. And he has come to the conclusion that some sort of hyper disease caused 250 species of animals to disappear in a very short period of time. Uh, what we have to consider here is have pieces of Mars or another planet landed on our Earth at one time and the organisms inside them unleashed some sort of devastating disease. NASA insists that we have nothing to fear, for the Mars samples will probably contain only dead organic matter. But NASA has been wrong before. After the Viking space probe first made contact with Mars in 1976, the space agency declared that the planet's soil and atmosphere were incompatible with life, for there were no organic compounds and no evidence of standing water. Two decades later, they were forced to admit that they were wrong and that Mars, in fact, contains both. Things can go wrong with uh, technology and there's the element of human error. With a Mars sample return, if you could imagine a capsule being filled with Ebola, would you want that coming down anywhere uh, in, in your territory? I can't imagine that anyone in the state of Utah will be looking forward to the return of this sort of sample. NASA promises that the canisters will have protective coatings and will be handled with the highest level of security. But Levin's own experiences with NASA leave him less than reassured. I'm worried about the Mars sample return mission because I saw what happened when they returned the moon rock. The moon rock was returned to a high quarantine facility with the same precautions that NASA is now advocating for Mars sample. But the sample escaped. Despite all the precautions, it escaped. Moon rocks were burglarized from a Louisiana laboratory, stolen from a transport van, and even lost in the mail. If the same thing happens to a Mars sample and it escapes to our environment, 
the soil, the water, the atmosphere. It could find something it likes there and take root. It could unleash uh, a pandemic of uh, biblical proportions and uh, otherwise uh, destroy Earth's delicate ecosystems. Our understanding of what constitutes life is narrow. Can we trust that we would even recognize an alien danger if we saw it? A Mars microbe would be invisible to the human eye, and it could lie dormant for years. We would be incapable of controlling or curing any disease it might create. And once it was unleashed, it could never be taken back. Is that a risk, something we want to take as a human civilization? I think that the Mars Sample Return mission isn't a national issue, that it's a global issue, and that we all have a voice in this. Are we on the brink of bringing another killer microbe to Earth? One that will make Ebola pale by comparison? Could Mars be the home of the ultimate doomsday virus? Do we dare risk our survival to find out? Later, these are the ultimate smart weapons, psychic spies. And is there a demonic hold on your heart? Some people have sympathy for the devil. Hail Satan. Next on In Search Of. Lucifer, Satan, the devil. By any name, he is the embodiment of evil. But is Satan an actual creature set loose upon humanity? Or is he merely a reflection of the darkest impulses that dwell in each of us? In this next story, we unlock the door to our darkest fears and stare straight into the face of the devil. Hail! Satan. Satan. Open wide the gates of hell and come forth from the abyss. He is the enemy of a, a society that is loving and caring toward one another. The devil is a destroyer. The devil is a paralyzer. The devil is a liar. The devil kills. In the name of Satan, ruler of the earth, king of hell, come forth from the pit. Bestow the blessings of hell upon us. For we are your children, and we invoke thee this night. We use the images of Satan and Lucifer to inspire us. The devil. As lord of the underworld, he is a vessel for all that is evil. He is the adversary of mankind that bears a thousand nightmares. But is the devil real, or a creation of religious authorities to manipulate the masses? Or is he, as some believe, a figure to be worshipped? Our search for answers begins in Loch Ness, Scotland. It was here in 1899 that the occult master Alistair Crowley conducted one of the most notorious experiments in history. Garrett, you do not know by the ancients of days I would Crowley himself claimed he was the great beast, a satanic monster mentioned in the biblical book of Revelation. Crowley's occult plan was to conjure the most vile of evil demons and force them to do his bidding. The setting for his most notorious ritual would be Boleskin House, Crowley's mansion near the shores of Loch Ness. As he wanted some quiet place where he could practice the magic of a magician called Abraham Alin the Mage. And it's a fairly long ritual and would usually take about six months or even longer. Some believe that Crowley was able to summon over a hundred hideous demons using a combination of ancient religious practices. In any event, something went terribly wrong at Boleskin House. During the several months it took Crowley to conduct the ritual, disaster struck many who were on the premises. A workman employed to renovate the house attacked Crowley and had to be locked in the basement. The caretaker went on a drunken spree and tried to kill his wife. Crowley's housekeeper disappeared without a trace. At 
one point, Crowley accidentally used a butcher's bill to write a magic incantation. Shortly after, the butcher chopped through his own arm, severed an artery, and died. But then, Crowley left Boleskine House before completing the ritual. If you invoke the spirits to come and help you out or to teach you or whatever, there's something important that has to be done afterwards. You banish them, you clear the air. He never did that. Crowley eventually vacated Boleskine House, but many of the subsequent owners suffered grave misfortune. I think anybody who tries to control the spiritual world is going to make a mess of it because these spiritual forces and, and entities don't want to be controlled and they will come in, pretend to be helpful, and then take over themselves. As for Alistair Crowley, he gained nothing but misery. One of his wives was committed to an insane asylum, and Crowley himself died in 1947, a penniless heroin addict whose life was filled with horror and gloom. It seems the devil had taken his due. Throughout history, the devil has been considered the lord of lies, and that is his trick. He offers you something wonderful, something beautiful, something you could never attain on your own, and you just have to possess it. But then invariably, once you've gone into the bargain with Satan, it goes horribly wrong. And of course, there's the phrase, be careful of what you wish for, you may get it. You do not give your soul to the devil for just a whistle and a smile. There is that warped hand that chokes and doesn't let go of you easy. It destroys. The devil is a destroyer. The devil is a paralyzer. The devil is a liar. The devil kills. Alistair Crowley was not the last famous person to cross paths with Satan. Some say the greatest blues guitarist of all time, Robert Johnson, may also have fallen victim to the devil, losing his life and soul. A mediocre musician, Johnson briefly disappeared from the music scene. He quickly returned with a talent that seemed supernatural to those who had heard him before. It is now said that he met the devil at this crossroads, selling his soul in return for musical genius. In 1938, Johnson was poisoned by a rival, and he died a few days after singing his famous lyric, Hello, Satan. I believe it's time to go. That fascination with the dark side can be heard even now in the music of death metal bands like Sadistic Intent and controversial rocker Marilyn Manson. Manson calls himself the Antichrist superstar. His followers are known as the Satanic Army. Manson was inspired by the most notorious advocate for Satan since Aleister Crowley. His name was Anton LaVey. Hail Satan! And we'll enter his Church of Satan when we come back. Hail Satan! Hail Satan! This program contains images which may be disturbing to younger or sensitive viewers. Parental discretion is advised. Does the devil walk among us? What form would he take? How would we recognize him? He comes to us in the disguise of beauty. He comes to us in the disguise of comfort. He comes to us in the disguise of pleasure. And so instead of the traditional evil images, he comes to us softly. And that's why he becomes so palatable in so many lives. And that's why so many lives are destroyed. And we accept that because we all want to be successful. We all want to be comfortable. We all want glory. By promising that glory to all who follow him, Anton LaVey changed the face of devil worship when he formed the Church of Satan in 1966. This San Francisco residence was home to LaVey and his followers. From within these walls, he invoked the spirit of Satan. Be with us tonight. Place us in a position of sovereignty that we might look down upon our inferiors. 
and cast their kin into the morass of mediocrity where they belong. LaVey believed that man's carnal nature, his lust, greed, vengeance, and ego had been unfairly labeled evil by Christianity. His influence was widespread. The invocation that Anton LaVey conceived of in the Satanic Bible is just a general calling forth the demons from hell and having them manifest your desires in this plane of existence. Shalom Barash. Shalom Barash. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. Blanche Barton read the Satanic Bible as a young girl. I've been a Satanist since I was 12 years old. With LaVey's death in 1997, Barton took over the Church of Satan. And the legacy of Aleister Crowley and Anton LaVey continues to attract followers through a group known as the Thelemic Order of the Golden Dawn. We certainly don't fear the devil. It represents the very principle of freedom within. David Carabim and his followers practice a religion based upon the work of Aleister Crowley. One of the things that we teach is to overcome fear. Fear nothing. Fear is an illusion. Each person has to come to a realization of their own law. To let others dictate to us what is best for us is to miss the whole point of existence. We are free. If there is a war between good and evil, it seems each soul hangs in the balance. And for those who go in search of the devil, a warning. It's been said that the devil's cruelest trick is to convince us that he does not exist at all. Is this woman being stalked by a psychic spy? We'll put his telepathic powers to the test, next on In Search Of. You are about to enter the world of America's secret soldiers, special agents armed with the powers of extrasensory perception. They can pinpoint a human target thousands of miles away, and absolutely nothing can shield their vision. As members of a highly classified CIA program, they waged a silent war using telepathic powers. Join us as we go in search of psychic spies. The full capabilities of the human brain go far beyond the tasks of everyday living. And some believe they have developed extraordinary mental powers. One of them is remote viewing. Remote viewers claim that they use extrasensory perception to gain a clear image of distant objects, people, and places. Exploring the limits of human consciousness, Stanford researchers Dr. Hal Putoff and Russell Targ developed the concept of remote viewing in 1972. It's a psychic ability, which means that you have direct access and direct experience to sights, sounds, smells, tastes, activities, and the visual representation of what's going on in a place that's hidden from your ordinary senses. Remote viewers believe that the basic concept of all extrasensory perception, or ESP, is that information swirls around us all the time, like a sky full of stars. Electrified particles contain impressions that are available if we know how to use them. So remote viewing is more attention management than it is anything else. This is the collective unconscious. We're immersed in that. Retired U.S. Army Major Ed Dames is a remote viewing pioneer. Dames was part of a military program that developed the technique. The 
program was an army program. It moved from army to the Defense Intelligence Agency and then to the Central Intelligence Agency and became Project Stargate there. Project Stargate was designed to gain access to the military secrets of countries hostile to the U.S. Their mission involved tracking Soviet submarines, locating missile silos, identifying germ warfare labs, and uncovering the whereabouts of rogue leaders. Colonel John Alexander was one of the officers who championed the use of remote viewing for military purposes. There was a great deal of effort to keep it secret because they were afraid of the giggle factor. I mean, here they were spending government money on projects that some would view as quite questionable. The remote viewers were able to deliver success where other agencies had failed. Remote viewing uh, was used by the military in a number of cases that were very dramatic. Uh, one of them was the Dozier case, where General Dozier had been kidnapped by the Red Brigade. And the information that was developed on that was extremely accurate. With only a black and white photo to start the process, one remote viewer was able to pinpoint the city, building, and room where General Dozier was being held. He was later rescued by counter-terrorism commandos and returned to American soil. Ed Dames left Project Stargate years ago. He now teaches civilians and claims we can all be trained to use our minds like radios, tuning into the unique electromagnetic signals that emanate from every individual or object. In search of wanted to put this claim to the test, so we secretly planted a human target in the Los Angeles area. We then challenged one of Ed Dame's students, Erin Donahue, to determine her exact location. Erin Donahue's only clue was the target's first name, Caprice. The technique speaks for itself. Based on my personal experience, it will uh, work. We'll be able to suss out this truth or this location. Forty-five minutes into the test, Aaron began to sketch what remote viewers refer to as a blueprint of the site and the target. Smell surface. It's all flat. It's flat. Angular textures. Smooth, smooth. Sound, sounds. Rushing, whooshing. Flat. The results are, to say the least, astounding. We'll show them to you when we come back. This woman is a target on the psychic battlefield. She is being stalked telepathically by this remote viewer. His only clue to her location is the woman's first name. The psychic spy is Aaron Donahue, and he was trained by this man, former U.S. Army Major Ed Dames. Since leaving the military, Ed Dames has been called in on the investigation of flight TWA-800 and several manhunts, including the search for the notorious Unabomber. He relies on a skill known as remote viewing, using extrasensory perception to locate distant targets. But does this really work? We return to Aaron Donahue and the remote viewing scenario we set up earlier. You'll recall that we've placed our human target in an undisclosed location, giving Aaron nothing to work with but her first name. Aaron is sequestered in a hotel, miles from the target site. With no access to a phone and under constant surveillance, he has no contact with the outside world. Dimensions flat, even, bridged. Like a snapshot slowly developing, Aaron's sketches come into sharper focus. Cool. 
cool, wet. Okay, let's go fringed, flat, trenched. Vague shapes, lines, and circles begin to form a more complete picture of Aaron's remote vision. There is a spinning structure turning slowly. The final sketches represent automobiles, airplanes, and a unique architecture that leads this remote viewer to only one possible conclusion. The question was, where is Caprice? The answer is encounter at LAX here in California. Aaron is dead on target. Using his remote viewing skill, he has zeroed in on the exact location of his quarry, a restaurant at Los Angeles International Airport. By conventional standards, Aaron Donahue's success seems inexplicable and astonishing. As a product of the strange alliance between psychics and the Pentagon, it seems that remote viewing has opened up a new world of perception. With their mind-bending powers, these psychic spies bear witness to the awesome possibilities contained in the most powerful weapon of all, the human mind. Thanks for watching In Search Of. I'm Mitch Pileggi. Good night. The following program deals with a controversial subject. The theories expressed are not the only possible interpretation. Viewers are invited to make a judgment based on all available information. This program contains images which may be disturbing to younger or sensitive viewers. Parental discretion is advised. Tonight on In Search Of. Is this the gentle caress of a passionate lover or the cold hand of death? Relive this victim's terrifying story in search of ghost lovers. Does the devil take control of innocent people? Can he be driven away by prayers and rituals? We'll look for the shocking truth and meet a real life exorcist. Automated marvels or mechanical monsters? This scientist says that robots will take over the world and it's going to happen a lot sooner than you think. Will anyone survive the robot Armageddon? Students enter this college in search of an education. What they get is a crash course in the supernatural. We'll hunt for ghosts on America's haunted campus. I'm Mitch Pileggi, and this is In Search Of. It is whispered that the dead continue to feel desire for the living. Mixing seduction with savagery, these ghost lovers are said to scar their victims so deeply that most encounters are never disclosed. Is the spirit world interested in more than just your soul? In our next story, love and lust transcend the grave. So I looked over at the corner of my eye and there's a shadow, this black shadow, like a figure standing over my bed. Well, needless to say, um, I was very afraid. There are people being attacked by sexual demons that totally devastate them. Something made me turn around, look back in the kitchen. 
and I seen something there that I ain't never seen in my life before. They're like, and it scared the Jesus right out of me. And I did not want to succumb to it anymore. It became very violent. More substantial than ghosts, more visible than poltergeists. These demons introduce themselves as dream lovers. But what begins in a whirlwind of lust is quickly transformed into an orgy of violence. These predators are known by two names, an incubus which attacks women and a succubus known to haunt men. What we're talking about is a real phenomena that attacks real people. And I have to use the word attack. A spirit can visit, they can give inspiration, they can project love. The succubus, the incubus, they project only one thing, and that's sexual attack. For Kathy Lewis, the incubus phenomenon is very real. After her loved ones died, she turned to the occult to contact them in the afterlife. She used Ouija boards, automatic writing, and a process that involves swinging a pendulum. I would communicate thinking I was speaking to my father, and, and then I would write messages out, and it would like swing in a circle or back and forth and he would start giving me information. There are other people here, would you like to speak to them? So then I started thinking, maybe I can get my father, maybe I can talk to my, my grandfather, my grandmother, so forth and so on. Believing that she was in contact with deceased relatives, she became obsessed and thought the force was giving her supernatural powers. Oh, I couldn't wait at night when the, my kids would go to bed so I could start doing it. I can take a long tapestry candle and burn it down, just like that. From the energy that I would draw from this thing. But soon after, things began to go very wrong. One evening in the summer, I went to bed, and uh, I was attempting to go to sleep. And then I'm like, something's in my room. So I looked over at the corner of my eye, and there's a shadow, this black shadow, like a figure standing over my bed. Well, needless to say, um, I was very afraid. My bed starts shaking. I get the foot of the bed like somebody's pushing it. And then I'd start to hear, like, scratching. This shadowy figure appeared frequently to terrorize her. I've been touched. My bed's been moved. My covers have been pulled. I've been pushed. I've been slapped. Dr. Christopher Cutter is a family physician who believes that some conditions stand outside current medical knowledge. He offers his opinion on this case. You would want to work her up with things like EEGs, uh, CAT scans, MRIs, looking for some abnormal process going on in the frontal lobe of her brain. Um, and if that's all normal, then we really start to run out of options. There aren't too many other conditions that are going to cause those types of events to happen. The dreamlike quality had disappeared, and there was no refuge to be found anywhere in Kathy's home. I would certainly recommend she not be messing around with the um, occult. It seems to be triggering some of the stuff. This individual had opened up some spiritual doors, practicing various means of divination. She invited evil to get involved in her life in a deep-seated way. And when it happened, she didn't know how to get rid of it. I don't know what's in this house, but I want it to leave. The curse of the incubus has yet to be broken despite Kathy's best efforts. The demon remains in her life. Kathy is not alone. Another victim of a predatory sexual ghost is Kathleen Rice. For this former nurse, her dream of a tall, dark, and handsome lover became a horrific nightmare. In the beginning, it, it looked like an attractive man. And, um, you know, in my dreams, obviously, I was very attracted to this man. One night, still unclear whether or not she was dreaming the whole situation, Kathleen confronted the presence. I turned around and I challenged it and I faced it. It was very angry. When it forces me down, it kind of like sits on me. I sat right up in bed, and I went and splashed water on my face because I'd been crying. And I looked at my neck, and it was a real burn mark. 
And that's when I started getting really scared and knowing for sure that this was definitely not a dream. After I finally realized it wasn't a real man, holding this thing that I thought was a man was very painful. Kissing it was like painful, but it still, it still haunts me and it's still there. Women are not the only victims. According to Bill Shelby, the 18th century home he moved into was already occupied by a 19th century succubus and the spirit of a jealous soldier who loved her. It was built back in 1782. There's a lot of history to this house. I'd say it had to be about a week when we moved in. We were remodeling this place. And uh, I was ordered by the dresser painting. And uh, the door that leads uh, the upstairs, well, it just kind of opened. And about maybe five minutes later, the door closed. And I heard the footsteps go up the steps. Then something made me turn around, look back into the kitchen. And I seen something there that I ain't never seen in my life before. They're like, and it scared the Jesus right out of me. He had like a Union uniform on. And I take it he was uh, in battle or something because he had a bandage on his head, like he had a head wound. And uh, there was blood on the bandage. And he was missing his right arm. And he held something up. It looked like a scalp. Bill was in uncharted territory, and soon after the menacing appearance of the Civil War soldier, he had an encounter with a beautiful woman from the same time period. She had like a low-cut turquoise blue dress on. She had real long, light brown hair. And she just stood there and she looked at me. I thought I was dreaming. It was soon after her appearance that the Civil War soldier began to attack Bill. And it felt like someone shoved me from behind. I flew across the living room here. Well, at that point, I covered my head. And uh, the door leads to the upstairs. It was rattling so hard, he literally broke the door. Well, then I tried to get up, I tried to run to the kitchen, and he shoved me again. This time he tossed me against that wall. At the same time, the spirit of the beautiful woman was beginning to seduce Bill. Then I started seeing that lady a lot more frequently. You know, I'd come home from work, she was sitting out on a swing that's outside. And it's weird because she didn't really scare me. It's like I felt comfortable with her being here. The feeling I got when she was around, it was the most calmest feeling I've ever felt in my life. I ain't kidding you, like time stood still. She would tell me some things, and like days later it would come true. Bill believed that when he moved into the centuries old house, he unknowingly placed himself in the middle of a love triangle. The more the woman's spirit appeared and comforted Bill, the angrier the Civil War soldier became. Bill's girlfriend tried to help clear the house of spirits. She placed a Bible on the staircase, but this only invited the wrath of the demon. In fact, nothing at all has deterred Bill's ghost lover, and he claims that he's still plagued by the paranormal assaults. For these three victims of the strange phenomenon of ghost lovers, there seems to be no end in sight. Doctors have yet to find any medical explanation for this phenomena. I've actually resorted to using prayer. I've asked priests to see patients. Um, I'm definitely considering now the possibility that there are otherworldly spirits or events that sometimes might be involved. After consulting religious clergy and medical doctors, they continue to be faced with the violence common to incubus and succubus encounters. If you feel that an incubus has manifested in your room, banish it. Tell it to leave. Tell it to be gone. And pray. Are ghost lovers real? Do they crave the essence of the living in order to gain power in the underworld? Be forewarned. That heavenly embrace may be an invitation to hell. Coming up, do the calculations of these robots include a plan to conquer the world? And 
a look at the disturbing events behind these ivy-covered walls. But first, was this child possessed by Satan? We'll relive the terrifying ritual that may have saved his soul. Ready to look the devil in the eye? In a moment, we'll take you inside the darkest of rituals, exorcism. As the last resort for those deemed to be in the clutch of Satan, the rites used to purify the damned can be as dangerous as they are controversial. We're entering ground zero in the war between good and evil. Evil has a human face, and that's why it can exist among us. I knew that their child was possessed. There was no doubt in my mind whatsoever. I'm gonna kill you. You. I'm gonna kill you! The 1973 film version of The Exorcist introduced most of us to the concept of being possessed by the devil. But not everyone knows that William Peter Blatty's bestseller was based on a true story of a boy we will call Robbie. In 1949, a young priest by the name of Father Halloran assisted Father Bowdern the exorcist in charge of removing the demon. Almost on every occasion that we were with uh, the little boy, ratings and uh, marks would appear on his body. I know he wasn't doing it, but something was happening, and I know it wasn't self-caused. You could spit right in your eye from about seven feet. Things happen that ordinarily don't happen. I had a holy water bottle thrown at me, and I looked over there, and there's no one near the dresser, not within five feet of the thing. Robbie's exorcist never gave up on the possessed child. And after weeks of intense sessions, their persistence finally paid off. Robbie sat up in bed with a new look of freedom. He's gone. And he said that St. Michael came and drove the devil away. And at the same time that that took place, and I mean exactly the same time, there was a huge uh, burst of light in the college church. A number of priests later reported that they saw the image of St. Michael floating above the church altar. Robbie's life amazingly returned to normal, and he remained in contact with the priest that apparently saved his soul. The boy grew up and became an engineer and Father Bowdern was present on his wedding day. Once in a blue moon, we do see some clinical phenomenon that we don't understand. Experts like psychiatrist Michael Lardin agree that the vast majority of patients are grossly psychotic. About 10 years ago, I worked at Bellevue Hospital in New York City, and there was a woman there who was very psychotic, and we were giving the standard medications that we use for psychosis, and she was speaking in tongues, and it had a religious preoccupation. The medications we gave were not really effective. <laughs> And then, unbeknownst to us, a group of religious people from the Caribbean came into the ER and performed some sort of religious ceremony on this patient. And the doctors, we stood to the side, and lo and behold, we saw this tremendous cathartic event with the woman. And the next thing we knew, the psychosis had resolved. Everything is all right now. Now, is that a case of possession? Uh, I don't know. Is that a case of psychosis that wasn't amenable to standard medication treatment? Or, or was this some phenomenon that we don't really understand? There's nobody that can tell me that the, the dark side does not exist out there because we lived it in our homes. One family recently lived through the nightmare of possession, but want to remain anonymous to protect their young son, whom we shall call Edward. Yes, we're your typical American family, happy and busy doing all the usual things until about December of 1998, when we saw a distinct change in Edward's behavior. And he suddenly became more violent, more aggressive. <laughs> Calm down. Some of the behavior that he had shown when he was possessed were, were maybe clawing to the hands. His back would get hunched. He would start huffing and puffing. 
Sometimes there would be a growl. Edward's parents were convinced that a demon had taken over their son. The night the demon spoke to us was probably the most chilling night I can remember. He'd look different. And finally I said, who are we talking to? And he came out and said, my name is Red. My name is Red. And he was here to kill you, pointing to me, and Kelly, pointing to my wife. He said, and after I kill you, I'm going to kill Edward. <laughs> and at that moment, I knew that we were in a spiritual battle. It was difficult finding help. The first place we did go was the church. We had gone through the medical route. Uh, we had gone through psychologists. We went to psychiatrists. The day that I found Judy Goodman was probably the best day of our lives. Since my birth, I've walked in two worlds, physical and spirit, which means that I see things other people don't see. I see angels. And as the case with the things we're going to be discussing now, demons. My first encounter with Edward, what a sweet, sweet soul he was. Edward, honey, there's somebody we'd like you to meet. This is Judy. Hi. Hi, Edward. How are you today? And there was a proverbial struggle of good and evil inside that little physical body that was very painful to this child. Really don't know how much longer he would have lasted if something had not been done. Judy asked Edward to draw some pictures for her, and his drawings were shocking. Edward started drawing an angel that Judy requested, and the angel had flames coming off of its shoulders. And another picture that Judy asked him to draw was a picture of himself. And he drew himself in red and brown colors, which he always used. But he also had a bubble around it, which was the containment to keep the, the demon inside. Demon was very much in full form, but it was time to show the dark spirit who it was dealing with. It's time for you to leave this boy's body. According to Edward's parents, Judy sent healing energy into their son by simply pressing two fingers into his chest. The energy force was so powerful that the metal crucifix he was wearing actually bent. Kelly and I were amazed, and that's all the proof we needed. We knew that we had the right, right person there. It's time. Contribute to energy. Hold on to yourself. Project through me. She was gradually doing a hand movement above Edward's chest, up by his throat to his head. At that point, she instructed Leo to open the window so she could throw the demon back out into the universe. As soon as that happened, Edward popped up. He had a beautiful blue twinkle in his eye, a smile on his face. He hugged Judy, told her he loved her, and hugged Leo and I both. At that moment, we knew our son was back. The joy we felt was overwhelming. We all hugged, we all cried. We knew our son was free from this grip of evil. And then we all went downstairs for a celebration with the family. About an hour later, when I took Edward back up to have a shower, we were in the bathroom, and suddenly he headbutted me. He reached out with a clawed, shaped hand, tried to scratch my face. Calm down. Stop. What is the matter? Hey, Calm down. down. Edward, what is the matter? The demon was absolutely going crazy. My heart sank. I knew at that moment, for some reason, it had returned. The feeling I had for the demon returned was Really, it was like we were at the highest high, and it was back to back the lowest low. Kelly and Leo called Judy in desperation, and she quickly returned to the house to face the demon once again. I had to take immediate control of the situation and pull in every bit of energy that I had, everything that my body could house. We had to just get the child in a in an immobile position, and I actually had to leave my body go inside the body of the child. And I remember very clearly bringing that energy back inside of me. Judy was laying on the floor. And for a split second, I saw her hands turn into the claw shape. And then they rested again. She sat up extremely tired, exhausted. Edward's demon behavior came to an immediate stop. He jumped down off the bed onto Judy's lap and hugged her again. After witnessing the second exorcism, I knew in my heart everything was fine. I know that 
Either we would have lost our son, or we would have been dead at this time if it wasn't for Judy Gooden. It's amazing to see Edward today. A short year and a half later, he's just a perfectly normal kid, loves sports. Myself, being in the medical profession, I would probably be one of the last people that would resort to something like this. We really couldn't find very many people that had any knowledge or information about this. So I've written the book in the hope of helping other people, other children, to find help if this is truly their problem. I believe that all of us are conscious of a certain amount of evil within all of us. But anybody could be possessed. Nobody is excluded. It is <laughs> Later on In Search Of, has the devil enrolled at this prestigious university? But first, are androids the tool of man or the implement of our destruction? You may never look at robots the same way again. Visions of the future predict a world populated by robots, programmed to do our bidding. But could this digital dream turn into a high-tech nightmare? Will artificial intelligence surpass our own intellect, turning us from master into slave? Join us for a glimpse of tomorrow and decide for yourself if we are facing a robot Armageddon. Man-made machines run our lives. They control our power plants, communication networks, and national defense systems. Now fuse that superintelligence with mobile robots. Arm them with flamethrowers, chainsaws, and 50 caliber rifles. Give them the power to swim, fly, and even reproduce, and you may glimpse a dark and deadly future. We're looking to a future with machines having much more intelligence than ourselves. How do we treat creatures less intelligent than ourselves? How do we treat cows and sheep and chimpanzees? Not very well at all. They're, they in zoos, pets, or we eat them. So if we're looking to machines being more intelligent than us, the best we can hope for, perhaps, is that we're human pets. The 21st century dominant question will be, I believe, who or what should be dominant species on this planet? Do we build gods? Or do we build our potential exterminators? Fascination with robots has fueled man's imagination for decades. But recent advances in the creation of a high-tech brain, or artificial intelligence, is about to revolutionize robotics. Artificial intelligence in general is evolving about a million times faster than our human brains. As human beings, it took us about a million years for us to double our brain capacity, whereas our computer chips are doubling every year or two, so you know, about a million times faster. So that means by about the year 2020, we will be able to make computers with vastly superior computing capacities than, than our human brain. Up to now, only science fiction has captured the potential of artificial intelligence when it links with robotics. But now that fantasy is on the edge of becoming reality. Robots, machines can communicate and understand in parallel. Thousands upon thousands of messages all around the world at the same time. Enormous advantage when we look to machine intelligence. At the cybernetics lab at the University of Reading, Dr. Warwick has robots that use artificial intelligence to learn and communicate. Nibbler and Zoidberg are two of our latest robots. They've got ultrasonic sensors on the front and also some on the back. They use these for detecting obstacles and so on. They've actually got infrared signaling on their heads and they can transmit signals to each other so they can communicate. They know where each other is. 
but because they're communicating to each other, one robot can tell the other, when you're in this situation, do this. When you're in that situation, do that. These artificially intelligent robots are some of the first primitive models. Generally, they have the equivalent brain capacity of a toddler. But with breakthroughs in technology occurring at an exponential rate, the next step may be a leap to highly intelligent robots. It is far more than merely processing a little bit of data and coming up with a pre-programmed response that is almost meaningless. Far, far more than that. We have robots now with robot brains that can learn and adapt. These robot warriors are the creation of Mark Pauline and survival research labs. I think that in many ways, uh, the experience is prefigures you know, a future where machines really will be alive, and we really have to treat them uh, with sort of a certain kind of respect. Are these machines pointing to a more sinister future where intelligent robots are not only smarter, but more violent than humans? No one knows. But some scientists do see a technology spinning rapidly out of man's control. So probably around 2040, 2050, Potentially, we could have machines that have computing capacities like tr trillions of trillions of trillions of times above our present level in the human brain. So humanity, as, as a species, we have to ask ourselves, do we want to make these sort of like godlike, potentially massively intelligent machines this century or, or not? Many scientists believe this is a dangerous threshold that could doom the human race. If this cap keeps narrowing between the human intelligence level and the robot artificial intelligence level, should humanity allow that to occur? Because if these machines become a lot smarter than us, then we become number two. And then our fate, our destiny, then depends on the machines. Will robots take over the planet? Could humans become obsolete? The stunning answer, when we come back. This program contains images which may be disturbing to younger or sensitive viewers. Parental discretion is advised. Could a new species of automatons replace every person on Earth? Two unstoppable forces are driving the race to develop highly intelligent robots. One is just the sheer economic momentum. I mean, the whole world economy will be based on uh, very smart robots, I, I believe. 50 years into the future, instead of spending our money on housing and cars, we'll probably be spending our big ticket money on robots. And the other big issue, of course, is the military momentum. The military has already deployed robotic weapons, including unmanned aircraft. Police bomb squads use robots for dangerous situations. The technology emerging from the military sector only fuels private research both competing for the most powerful robots. Many see it as the next technological evolutionary step, but at what price? We've seen what nuclear weapons do, and somehow we've managed to keep a lid on it largely for quite a number of years. But intelligence isn't like that. Realistically, I can't see any direct way, uh, politically, of actually stopping us getting into the situation where machines more intelligent than ourselves actually take over. If these artificially intelligent robots decide our destiny, it will be a future where mankind will have the significance of the lowest form of life, if we are allowed to exist at all. Once we have switched on machines that are more intelligent than ourselves, not only are we not going to be able to switch them off again, really they will be running our lives for us. We will have deferred our existence on Earth to them. Of course, the human race does have one advantage. Robots can't reproduce. Or can they? Scientists are researching a robot that can create another robot with almost no help from humans. 
These machines possess incredible strength, and their metal hides are far tougher than our fragile skin. They do not know fear, nor can they feel pain. It is hard to imagine that they would show mercy to an obsolete species. For humans, I'm afraid life's not going to be very pleasant. As a very, very low intelligence being on Earth, we'll be treated perhaps something like cows or sheep or chimpanzees are treated now. Will man become a living specimen for the amusement of these godlike machines? Will the automated servants of today become our masters tomorrow? If only the strong survive, this may be the face of the future. Blood-drenched asylum, ghostly burial grounds, satanic imagery. What evil lurks on the grounds of America's most haunted campus? Find out next on In Search Of. Stroll down Fraternity Row on any college campus, and you're bound to see some hellish behavior. But the students of one university claim their biggest bash is thrown by the anguished souls that haunt its ivy-covered halls. Was this college built on sinister ground? Our story takes us to Athens, Ohio, for a tour of the haunted campus. Ohio University, nestled in the middle of America's heartland, a seemingly ordinary college in an ordinary town. But when the sun goes down, there emerges a far different and darker scenario. It's not an abnormal situation for someone to say, yeah, uh, we had random lights coming on in our dorm. A couple buildings on this campus are haunted. Several things are unexplainable on this campus. I don't think anybody should really be closed to the possibilities of um, supernatural things going on here because that's just the nature of the area. Athens, Ohio was settled in 1797. Ohio University, the first college in the Northwest Territory, was founded just seven years later. The school is located in an eerie spot. Whether by coincidence, or design no one knows. There are five cemeteries surrounding the entire campus, and these five cemeteries form a circle. Uh, a girl was studying there late. late the Graduate night. student Ben Shoemaker is an expert on the university's haunted history and gives ghost tours of the campus. Now, if you were to actually link these cemeteries in a straight line, uh, you can form a pentagram. The pentagram is a symbol of the occult. All the buildings within this pentagram are alleged to be haunted, except for the administration building at the pentagram's exact center. Graduate student Carrie Brannan claims she's had ghostly encounters during her years at the university. Her first occurred during her sophomore year when she lived in Wilson Hall. Legend has it that this dormitory is built on top of an Indian burial ground. At first, her roommate thought that Carrie was responsible for the unexplainable events. Things would just come up missing. Um, lights would come on in the middle of the night and be like, Carrie, why'd you leave the light on? And I would be adamant that I did not turn the light on and we would just never know. I would have this recurring dream that there was somebody hovering over me when I was asleep. It was dark and I would get up and I would still see them. But when she turned on the light, there was no one there. At first, she thought her nocturnal visitor was one of her roommates, or the product of an overactive imagination. Then her dream took an ominous turn. One night, um, spring quarter of last year, um, my roommate, who has the other room upstairs, her boyfriend was sleeping in there. And um, I had the dream again, except this time I felt hands around my neck. And it scared the daylights out of me. I ended up going downstairs and just sitting up on the couch. The next morning, Carrie told her roommates what happened. And my roommate stopped me, and she actually dropped her spoon, because we were all eating breakfast, and she said, 
oh my gosh, she said Dylan, which is her boyfriend, had woken her in the middle of the night and accused her of putting her hands around his neck. And she said, you know, Dylan, I didn't do that. And he said, well, you know, I, I felt someone with their hands around my neck. Carrie still can't explain what happened that night, but the memory will be with her forever. Every time I talk about it now, even now I get cold chills. I'm not one to be, oh, there's ghosts in my house. But when someone has the exact same experience with you in the exact same night, same level of the house, you have to ask yourself, what happened? Carrie's story isn't Wilson Hall's only ghostly tale, nor is it the most frightening. In the late 1970s, the dorm was the home of a young woman who reportedly practiced witchcraft. In thy dark spirits. Her neighbors were accustomed to hearing her chant, but one night was different from the rest. They also heard a very loud scream. When dorm officials finally unlocked her door, they found her lying there, dead. All over one wall, there were all these different uh, drawings, pentagrams, uh, symbols that no one really could understand. It was all drawn from this girl's own blood. School officials tried to paint over the walls, but witnesses alleged that the young woman refused to be silenced. Even though they painted over all the blood, all the different things that had been written on the wall, somehow they always seemed to bleed through. Other ghost stories have been traced to the university's hidden past. We'll share the dark secrets of the haunted campus when we come back. Ohio University has earned a reputation as America's haunted campus. A few years ago, a group of young women allegedly spotted a ghost while exploring the catacombs of Jefferson Hall. They were walking through the hall and they found an open room. They looked inside the room and they saw this old lady. She was hovering above a chair, about one inch off the chair. The woman was transparent. Frightened, the girls quickly ran to get a resident advisor. They brought the RA back to the room uh, and found that the room was locked and that once they got inside the room, there was no one inside. Perhaps the eeriest place on this ivy-covered campus is the complex known as the Ridges. Some people would consider this the paranormal epicenter of a high university in Athens, Ohio. I've been up here at night before, and I will never come up here at night again. You wouldn't catch me dead here. Today, most of the Ridges buildings are closed. But for over a hundred years, it bustled as a lunatic asylum. What you see on the outside isn't always what's on the inside. A beautiful building, beautiful grounds, it's not necessarily what's inside. Filmmaker Ann Hulagard recently finished a documentary about a particularly gruesome period in the Ridge's history. In the early 50s, people who were put into the asylum sometimes shouldn't, absolutely should not have been there. Old age, homosexuality, menopause, or female trouble was sometimes the diagnosis people were admitted for. No matter what the diagnosis, the treatment was the same. Dr. Freeman, um, who sort of created the ice pick lobotomy, stopped at Athens Asylum many times and performed these lobotomies to 40 patients at a time. It's said that evidence of unspeakable suffering can still be found inside today. You see all these different signs that patients used, pentagrams, you see three sixes, you see different things that patients actually carved into the wall. You see different stakes in the cement, and you have to ask yourself, why would there be two stakes basically at arm's length uh, in a wall for it? One former grad student told Ben of the night that she and a friend used the underground tunnels that connect the buildings. She looked over to a wall, and she saw in blood uh, I was never crazy, and it was written there by a patient who had killed themselves. You can't help but feel there are unresolved issues, injustices, souls crying out that still want to be heard when you come here. You can really feel their presence. One patient is particularly famous for the indelible mark she made here. In December of 1978, Margaret Schilling went for a walk and never came back. And they did a search through the whole uh, asylum for her and they couldn't find her. And after a few weeks, they gave up. But five weeks after she um, 
was thought to be missing. The custodian found her up in the attic. Margaret Schilling lay dead on the ground, her arms crossed on her chest. She was nude, and her clothes were in a pile next to her. And um, her body had somehow decomposed on the cement and left a perfect image, um, outline of her body. I've seen the actual stain on the floor where Margaret Schilling actually lay down and died. The janitors, they've tried to clean it so many times, you can see the scrub marks where they've tried to get rid of it, and it just won't go away. Today, many students are too afraid to venture up to the grounds. Ghost stories like these have stirred up controversy on campus. The university is very sensitive to the haunting stories. They don't want it necessarily to come out that they're the haunted campus, the haunted Ohio University. University officials may try to deny their existence, but the poltergeists on this campus seem determined to make their presence known. And until another explanation can be found, the flashing lights, frightening figures, and noises emanating from empty rooms will all be considered the handiwork of the ghosts of Ohio University. Thanks for watching In Search Of. I'm Mitch Pileggi. Good night. The following program deals with a controversial subject. The theories expressed are not the only possible interpretation. Viewers are invited to make a judgment based on all available information. This program contains images which may be disturbing to younger or sensitive viewers. Parental discretion is advised. Tonight on In Search of. A touch of the hand, a prayer to heaven, and the sick are suddenly cured. Or are they? Countless people pin their hopes on the claims of faith healers. Are these con artists or miracle workers channeling the awesome power of God? Is the future a world of technological marvels or mad scientists and man-made monsters? We'll look for answers when we go in search of the real Frankenstein. Is this the actual face of Jesus Christ? Was his image burned into this fabric during a supernatural resurrection? We'll offer startling scientific research into the Shroud of Turin. Many believe that visitors from space laid the cornerstones of modern civilization. But this man claims a blood connection still flows in our veins. Join the shocking search for alien ancestors. I'm Mitch Pileggi, and this is In Search Of. Faith healers. Thousands claim they are miracle workers, picking up where medical science leaves off. But can the hand of man channel God's salvation when all else fails? Skeptics call them the cruelest hucksters on the planet, but many claim faith healers save lives. Soulless charlatans or heavenly healers? You be the judge. I want to see the hands of other people that I have prayed for that God has healed. Would you slip your hands up and wave them around? And holler, amen. Yeah. I have dealt with thousands and thousands of cases of demon possession. Go to torment. We let this man come back. Go to torment. I touch you in the name of Jesus. 
May God bless you. May God keep you. I've seen millions of miracles under his ministry. Father, take this lady in Jesus' mighty name and make her whole. Witch doctors, exorcists, faith healers. When conventional medicine fails and doctors run out of answers, desperate people seek a supernatural cure. I had an aunt that was blind in one eye all her life, way before I was born, and she got healed, and she could see out of that blind eye. Ten years ago, I was healed of bone cancer. I saw a little crippled boy, and when they took the braces off, that child ran all over the theater. There are 200 children in the world, or people in the world, that wouldn't have been here without my work. I've been able to cure chronic fatigue syndrome. I've been able to literally cure uh, many people with arthritis. Critics claim that faith healing is often staged, or that the patient is suffering from an imaginary illness cured by the power of suggestion. But new medical research counters that skepticism. Religion and a person's faith does seem to play a role in their health. Dr. Harold G. Koenig, author of The Healing Power of Faith, is a professor at Duke University Medical Center and the director of Duke's Center for the Study of Religion, Spirituality, and Health. Today, there are nearly 80 medical schools that have courses on religion, spirituality, and medicine that helps to train doctors what this means, what role religion plays in the lives of patients when they are sick with health problems. As we have faith that initiates a healing process in our body that could have some remarkable changes in physical health. Reverend Leroy Jenkins has been a faith healer since 1960, after a serious injury put his own faith to the test. You are healed by the power of God. I had an accident where this plate glass window had bursted and fell through and severed my arm. Jenkins almost died on the operating table. Doctors reattached his arm, but it developed gangrene. They told him they would have to amputate. I had planned to get in my car, drive 100 miles an hour, hit this big oak tree big as this room here and end it all. Instead, he ended up at a revival meeting. The preacher looked back there and he said, where's the man that cut his arm off? To come up here. The preacher told Jenkins that he would be healed if he believed. So I said, well, I believe this can happen. When I said that, I felt this fire. It, like my whole arm was burning. Just, it's hard to describe. And I, and I looked, and my fingers was moving. Even more amazing, a few minutes later, Jenkins healed someone else. A lady runs up to me, and she said, oh, I've got a stiff wrist that, for 17 years. And she said, and would you heal me? And I said, yeah. And her wrist, I took it with my other hand, it popped. And I went immediately into the ministry, not even knowing how to read. And God taught me everything that I have learned through experiences. For you are healed in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be thou made whole. Somebody praise the Lord with her. He started his own church in Delaware, Ohio. Known as the man with the miracle arm, Jenkins claims he has healed countless people with his touch. There's like a supernatural thing. My hand. It feels like a small voltage of electricity in my hand all the time. And I'm not kidding, I feel it burning. Same way it was the night I was healed in Atlanta, Georgia. I saw Reverend Jenkins pray for a little girl that was four years old and was blind and couldn't see at all. And God healed her and she walked away seeing. Touching somebody and them falling backwards and getting healed is ridiculous, it's ludicrous. But then when you, when you research it for six months out of your life and you find that there, something is happening, something really is going on. Damien Chapa first met Jenkins when he was eight years old. I saw this man in a red jacket. Sort of reminded me a little bit of Elvis. Now he's turning Jenkins' life story into a movie titled The Calling. You get fascinated by his charisma. And what is it, this thing that happens when he touches people? 
What happens when they fall down? Though faith healing is generally thought to be a Christian tradition, there are Jewish practitioners as well. Kabbalists have been healing throughout time. Los Angeles Rabbi Fred Dweck has studied the Kabbalah, a type of Jewish mysticism, for 40 years. The Torah, the five books of Moses, contain secrets about everything, the entire universe, in code. And the study of Kabbalah is basically the understanding of those codes, pulling out the secrets. One of the secrets is that God, during creation, provided for ways to get around nature or natural law. Rabbi Dweck discovered that he had a gift for healing at an early age. I found out at seven years old that when I touched people, I knew what was going on inside of them. And uh, over time, I found that I could relieve pain, I could do healing. More importantly, in the beginning at least, I could diagnose things that doctors weren't able to diagnose. A typical case involved a woman sent to Dweck by her doctor. He says to me, Fred, he says, I'm going to send you a patient who had a melanoma in her shoulder, but we got it all. When I put her on the table and I started to do what I do, I realized immediately that the melanoma had gone to her liver. Dweck called the doctor and told him what he saw. But when the doctor did a scan, he found nothing. I said, wait a month and do another scan, which is exactly what happened. He called me a month later. He says, Fred, I found it. He said, you beat the x-rays. Rabbi Dweck claims that he uses the energy in the universe to heal his patients. Can you feel the warmth going into you? Yeah. Stephanie Hechtman came to Rabbi Dweck for help with joint pain and chronic fatigue syndrome. What's been going on with your intestines? Your small intestines and your colon feel irritated and, and weak. <clears throat> My stomach's been upset. That's the first time that I ever felt anything that powerful. Is that uh, very traumatic for you? but I could feel the energy coming through a lot, mm -hmm. a lot, and I felt it in my intestines. It was weird. I mean, it was good, but I could definitely feel it. While faith healers are quick to claim success, there is no telling how many times they fail to cure the hopeful. But for Reverend Jenkins and Rabbi Dweck, even failure is a matter of faith. According to Dr. Koenig, the latest research not only corroborates the claims of these healers and their followers, it actually proves that religion makes people live longer. People who attend religious services on a regular basis are about 40% more likely to be alive after a six-year follow-up period than are people who aren't attending religious services. So the, the effect on a person's longevity of being a regular attender at religious services is equivalent to that of not smoking cigarettes. Science has no conclusive explanation for these remarkable findings, but that doesn't diminish their impact. The truth of the matter is there is so much that goes on in the universe that we don't know and we don't understand. And that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It just means we don't know about it and we don't understand it. And God is going to bless you with everything that you need. Is it a case of faith, fakery, or mind over matter? Thou made whole in the name of Jesus. To those who no longer suffer from pain or illness, the answer may be irrelevant. And countless believers will continue to defy the skeptics, reject conventional wisdom, and trust their lives to the mysterious power of faith. be upon you this day fall. Coming up, could the fibers of this sacred cloth prove the very existence of God? Examine the Shroud of Turin. And did alien architects shape the wonders of the ancient world? You be the judge. But first, is science ready to breathe life into Frankenstein's monster?
With scientists now poised to clone human beings, man at last has the power to create life. Will this breakthrough in biotechnology create a race of perfect specimens or a new species of man-made monsters? Are we in search of a better future or a world of future Frankensteins? In early horror films, an ambitious scientist plays God to create life for the benefit of mankind and his own glory. But instead of creating a man, he makes a monster. Frankenstein's monster then escapes from the lab and wreaks havoc on an unsuspecting world. Is this fantastic fiction or terrifying fact? Probably the most frightening thing is the fact that science is progressing so rapidly that oftentimes discoveries are made before the public is even aware that they're a possibility. Is modern science on the verge of bringing Frankenstein's monster to life? Or has the deed already been done? In search of answers, we follow a trail of mad scientists, bizarre experiments, and reanimated corpses. My name is Victor Frankenstein. On a dreary night in November, I beheld the accomplishment of my toys. By the glimmer of the nearly burnt out candle, I saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open and his limbs begin to stir. Mary Shelley was only 18 when she started writing Frankenstein. Published in 1818, this chilling tale of a monster created by man has fascinated people for almost 200 years. I think the Frankenstein legend is so enduring because it speaks to the fears that people have about science. People are really afraid that science is stepping on the toes of God. Mankind has tried for centuries to bring the dead back to life. And the real Frankenstein castle in Darmstadt, Germany, was the site of some of the earliest experiments. They were conducted by an 18th century alchemist named Johann Conrad Dippel, who called himself Dippel Frankensteiner. Like all physicians of his time, the real Dr. Frankenstein brought corpses to his laboratory and cut them open to learn more about human anatomy. But legend also has it that he did much more than just examine those bodies. He attempted to reanimate the dead with a formula of bones, hair, and human blood. And some accounts say that Conrad Dippel assembled the parts from different bodies to create a monster. Some locals even believe that his monster still wanders the nearby forest. Conrad Dippel's name has faded from history. But the macabre fascination with life and death did not end with his experiments. Because his work with dead bodies is so controversial, some people call Gunther von Hagens a modern day Dr. Frankenstein. Also known as Mr. Plastinator, von Hagens creates art out of corpses. He replaces body fluids with silicone, epoxy, and polyester polymers, thus preserving bodies in their original form down to the last cell and vein. This vivid exhibit, called Körperwelten or Body Worlds, is currently on display in Germany. Von Hagen's accomplishment in preserving dead bodies pales in comparison to the work done by today's bioengineers. Dr. James J. Walter is a bioethicist at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. Genetic engineering is going to be any attempt to change, alter, modify, manipulate the genetic material of the human person. Genetic engineering aims to create improved and enhanced life forms. Human genes will also be added to animals. Reproductive cloning Another form of bioengineering is at the center of a firestorm of controversy, for it creates offspring identical to the DNA donor. A lot of benefits can come from this, of course. Childless couples have a child. Could the ability to genetically improve people cause more problems than it solves? 
Feelings about this topic run so high that many scientists involved in cloning research refuse to talk to us. Some think the cost in human terms would be immense because cloning is currently an imperfect technology that usually produces deformed creatures. Hundreds of embryos were destroyed in the process of creating Dolly, the first cloned sheep. The same would be true in cloning humans. The morality of experimenting on human embryos, knowing that we're going to destroy them, is problematic. I think we are improperly playing God with cloning. Human cloning is banned in the United States as well as many other countries around the world. But that doesn't mean attempts aren't being made. I'm guessing within five years we'll have a human clone. Biochemist Bridget Boissoulier is the science director of CloneAid. The company CloneAid actually will be cloning a, a young baby who died uh, just a few months ago. The cloning of this baby is to me a good way to show to everybody that it is possible to recreate ourselves and that actually life is not mystical, life is not a power of God. If clonade is successful, will we, like Dr. Frankenstein, have brought the dead back to life? I think the most frightening thing about it is, would they be the same? Would, would they be the same person that I loved when I bring them back? We're not bringing back little Johnny who did die. It's genetically little Johnny, but it's not really little Johnny. What made Johnny who Johnny is, is all of his experiences and his life with the family and all of his friends. Human cloning is clearly in our future, but exactly what will this scientific breakthrough bring? Will we create a class of superhumans? And what will happen to those who aren't genetically enhanced? No, we've not thought this out. This is our typical pattern of scientific discoveries that we can just move forward and worry about controlling the damage down the line. Well, once the genie's out of the bottle, you can't control the damage. The most frightening and most likely scenario is that ambitious scientists will allow their curiosity to override their common sense and create something they can't control. We're going to make a monster. But like the Frankenstein monster, it will always exceed the expectations of the creator because now it's independent and it has a life of its own and it will seek to live its own life. And it's not going to be what I want it to be. Even though it will look like me, it's not going to be me. And I'm not going to bend it to my will because it will have its own will, just as the Frankenstein monster had its own will. The fictional tale of Dr. Frankenstein and his monster has terrified people for almost two centuries. But if today's scientists turn that fiction into fact, the consequences could terrorize future generations forever. Later on In Search Of, did interplanetary visitors change the course of human evolution? We're in search of our alien ancestors. But first, the Shroud of Turin. Is this the authentic burial cloth of Jesus Christ? This scientist thinks he knows the truth. The Shroud of Turin. It may be the most sacred and controversial artifact in the world. The cloth that is said to have covered Jesus in his death has triggered a virtual holy war since its discovery in the Middle Ages. Is it a medieval fake or evidence of the resurrection? Now science has collided with faith in the quest to determine the true origin of the mysterious veil. He may be the most important figure of all time and his death on the cross may be more famous than any moment in history. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ is reenacted each year in the Philippines. To honor Good Friday, the day Christ was crucified, volunteers are literally hung from the cross. 
enduring the unimaginable pain of nails being driven through their palms. They can only remain on the cross for a few agonizing minutes. We believe we know how Jesus died, but what happened to his body afterwards has been a subject of debate for centuries. In Turin, Italy, one frail artifact may hold the secret to the mystery. The Shroud of Turin is believed by many to be the actual burial cloth of Jesus Christ. It seems to show a faint imprint of his actual face and crucified body. The Shroud was first publicly discovered and displayed in France in the 1300s. Since then, the Shroud has been kept in this cathedral in Turin, Italy. The Catholic Church only occasionally allows the fragile cloth to be publicly displayed. The question as to whether the shroud image is an authentic image of Jesus or not really is a scientific question. It's just since the advent of photography when the shroud and when the shroud was photographed for the first time that scientific interest has been raised. The very first photographs of the shroud were taken in the 19th century by an Italian named Secondo Pia. One of the first unexplained aspects of this mysterious cloth was revealed when processing the negative. The faint image of the shroud actually seemed to come alive in the sharp black and white contrast of the negative. The image clearly showed the details of a man's face and body. Modern-day Italian photographer Aldo Goreschi has used current techniques to fully study the photographic details of the shroud. The photographic negative, which I am showing you of the front and the back, reveals instead how this figure emerges as an absolutely perfect man. For example, at the level of the face, we start to see drops of blood around the hair and on the forehead, which were probably consequences of puncture wounds, probably referring to the crown of thorns. Until modern science could more thoroughly study the Shroud of Turin, skeptics simply dismissed it as a painting. But if the shroud was a forgery from the Middle Ages, the artist would have placed wounds through the palms, duplicating the conventional artwork of the day. One of the controversial aspects of the shroud image was that it showed the nail wounds through the wrist instead of the palms of the hands. Recent scientific studies experimenting with the hands of cadavers proved that the only way to hold the weight of a body in crucifixion was by driving the nails through the wrist area. These studies confirmed this medical accuracy of the shroud. One of the strongest arguments against the cloth's authenticity occurred in the late 80s. The Catholic Church allowed the shroud to be tested using radiocarbon dating. This process determines an item's approximate age by measuring its exposure to carbon dioxide. A small sample along the edge of the precious cloth was used. The findings were a blow to shroud believers because the results dated it back to the time of the Middle Ages when it was first discovered. However, many scientists see flaws in the results of these experiments. Dr. John Jackson believes that the chance for an accurate dating may have been lost forever when the shroud caught fire in 1532. At the time of the 1532 fire, the carbon-14 content of the shroud linen was uh, significantly altered by many centuries because of an interaction at elevated temperatures with the carbon dioxide in the air. Carbon dating is not everything that it, people think it is. It's what we call rogue sampling. Many, many items have been carbon dating that have been wrong uh, by thousands of years that we know where the, what the date really was. Dr. Frederick Zugaby is the medical examiner for Rockland County, New York. He also considers himself a forensic expert on the shroud. Actually, I've been studying the Shroud of Turin for about 50 years. The medical examiner's specialty is reconstruction of mechanism, manner, and cause of, of death or injury. 
Dr. Zugaby created his own crucifix apparatus to try to simulate its effects on the human body. The nailing of the hands, the nailing of the feet, the length of time up almost up to six hours on the cross are there would cause shock. Zugaby alleges that the stains on the shroud match the wounds that were inflicted on Jesus. In collating it with the scriptures, the Shroud of Torrent was extremely accurate. Rivulets of blood coming from the points of penetration of the crown of thorns, the various bruises on the face. There was over 100 scourge wounds on the whole body, front and back. The blood on all parts of the body, there is no image. What does that mean? It means that the blood was there before the image. If Dr. Zugaby's forensic work shows evidence of a crucifixion, it is not yet proof that the victim was Jesus Christ. But one scientist's bizarre experiment may support that claim. We'll have the radioactive results when we come back. This program contains images which may be disturbing to younger or sensitive viewers. Parental discretion is advised. Could this be the true face of Jesus Christ? How was this image permanently imprinted on the Shroud of Turin? Some scientists believe that when his body was wrapped in a burial shroud and placed in a cave, at some point it was exposed to a powerful burst of radiation. It's believed that the radioactivity was created by the resurrection. If there were a radiation effect that caused the image, it would fit in with the biblical theory of the resurrection. Those of us that believe in the resurrection, we know that that body went from a potentially corruptible state to an incorruptible state. Some, some biochemical transformation had to take place. In an attempt to duplicate the radiation effect allegedly caused by the resurrection, Dr. Aceta submitted himself to a rare medical procedure where radioactive material was injected into his own body. He was then scanned and photographed to produce three-dimensional x-rays. What I'd like to demonstrate here are similarities between what nuclear imaging would do from a real human subject compared to the shroud image. These computer images show the amazing effects of emitted nuclear radiation coming from his body. A slide image of the Shroud of Turin is placed on a light table, which the computer converts into a dramatic three-dimensional image. The radiated image of Dr. Aceta is remarkably similar to the unusual three-dimensional image found on the cloth of the Shroud. So in our opinion, the image uh, is due to some form of radiation. You don't have to reproduce a resurrection to appreciate an energy phenomena occurring within the cloth, giving rise to an anatomically accurate image of the body inside the shroud. The totality of the scientific argument is that this is the burial cloth of Jesus. We have more evidence that this is the case than we have evidence of most things that we call fact in the world today. For as many scientists that maintain that the shroud is authentic, there are other members of the scientific community that still have their doubts. In the search for answers, we may be verging on a breakthrough. Until we have definitive proof the Shroud of Turin will remain a matter of faith. E.T. may not be as alien as you think. Some shocking evidence that we may all have extraterrestrial ancestors. Next on In Search Of. The pyramids of Egypt represent one of mankind's greatest accomplishments. Or do they? 
Is it possible that the stunning breakthroughs of early civilizations are actually evidence of close encounters that changed the course of history and human evolution? And if UFOs did fill the ancient sky, was technology all they left behind? You be the judge, as we go in search of our alien ancestors. The engineering feats of ancient civilizations have been a source of endless mystery. The megalithic structures are the, the evidence of a worldwide culture in antiquity that was highly superior, highly advanced relative to us. Have our achievements always been the product of human imagination? Or did we make a giant leap into the future with the help of alien intervention? Real engineers and architects look at those same structures, they're blown away. They can't see how ancient man could have even built these amazing structures. Some experts contend that the Giza pyramids' many chambers were specifically designed to create microwave radiation. There is also evidence that ancient civilization had another modern source of energy. We know that the ancients had electricity, as incredible as it seems. German archaeologists have found an ancient battery in Baghdad. They know that it was used for electroplating. This battery is over 2,000 years old. Could primitive man alone have developed this advanced technology? One way to possibly explain all of these mysterious technological devices is literally alien intervention. Extraterrestrials coming here with their advanced technology and then giving it to mankind or, or using it with them. One of the most convincing discoveries that supports this controversial theory lines the walls of an Egyptian pyramid. We're here 50 miles north of the city of Luxor in the Valley of the Kings. Giorgio Sukolos editor of the legendary times goes deep into the 5,000 year old chamber and this is why we came here how did the ancient egyptians illuminate the inside of their temples if they did not have mirrors if they did not have torches if they weren't able to carve these stones outside well could they have used electric light bulbs It's commonly believed that burning torches provided the only light here. But torches would have left extensive evidence of scorch marks throughout the cavernous chambers. Researchers are puzzled to find that none exist. There is one possible explanation. To the modern eye, this spontaneously reminds of a light bulb, of an electric light bulb. The symbol of energy, the snake, is encased in a clear tube. It serves as a filament, just like a modern light bulb. The secret of electricity was given to the Egyptians by the extraterrestrials. Across the globe in South America, there is more compelling evidence of alien intervention. An amulet was found in the Cumbia region of Colombia that dates back to 500 AD. It has aerodynamic features that were not developed until the 20th century. It has delta-shaped wings like modern warplanes. The triangle-shaped rudder allows for high-speed maneuverability. Some experts compare the design to our own space shuttle. Two researchers decided to test the aerodynamics of the amulet. They built a larger model with a radio-controlled engine. The fascinating thing is that uh, this model shape is almost 1,500 years old. If this artifact is evidence of ancient aerospace technology, who would have flown the original machine? Located deep in the jungles of Mexico, amidst ruins of the ancient Mayan civilization, sits the Temple of the Inscriptions. Inside this structure is a tomb decorated with an image of the god Pakal. The carving features a man flying what appears to be a spaceship. 
His hands are working controls and he's attached to what looks like a breathing apparatus. Emanating from the engine of the ship are flames. Could this be an alien visitor? In his book, Technology of the Gods, writer David Hatcher Childress claims that the science fiction fantasy of the early 20th century may have already been a reality thousands of years ago. When you read the ancient Indian epics, like the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, they read like the wildest science fiction. People are flying around in airships called Vimanas. They're blasting each other with ray guns. Entire cities are decimated by these airships. This prehistoric Australian painting illustrates a humanoid creature with the enlarged head and eyes commonly attributed to the alleged extraterrestrials known as greys. But some researchers say that advanced technology was not the only evidence of an alien presence. Lloyd Pye believes that we are the living offspring of extraterrestrials. His shocking theory, when we come back. Was early technology a gift from alien visitors? Some suggest that our entire species is of extraterrestrial origin. I believe that human beings are descended from an alien race of beings off Earth and that the evidence is very clear in both our genes and in written history that the superior race lived on Earth in the distant past. The primary historical source for this shocking conclusion is the extensive writing of the Sumerian civilization. The Sumerians thrived in Mesopotamia in 3800 BC. They came out of the Stone Age approximately 6,000 years ago and went right into, walked right into a very highly advanced civilization that produced over a hundred of the first that we attribute to civilization. According to Lloyd Pye, they attribute the origins of their rapid growth to aliens called the Anunnaki. The Anunnaki are a race of beings that are very human-like in their physical structure. And what they said is that the, the people from Nibiru, the Anunnaki, came to Earth around 400,000 years ago, needing to mine gold. That was their primary need, was to take gold to repair their atmosphere. In the same way that we're destroying our atmosphere in our rise to a high technology, they had damaged their atmosphere and needed to repair it. Pai says the Anunnaki genetically engineered slaves to mine the gold, and in the process, transformed Neanderthal man into Cro-Magnon man. They wanted their new slave to be better adapted physically to the planet than they were. So the, creature, uh, the creatures of Earth would be some creature that was indigenous to the planet that would be upright walking, that would be able to blend with their genetic code and produce a hybrid that would be fertile and, and be able to reproduce itself ad infinitum. Lloyd Pye claims the Anunnaki used the Neanderthal, a species of early man, as their guinea pigs. They took some of the genes of the creatures of Earth, some of the essence of the creatures of Earth, and mixed it with themselves, mostly themselves, because they wanted a slave and a servant that was like them. And the product of that genetic manipulation project was the Adamu, or human beings as we are today. Lloyd Pye believes that this skull, labeled Star Child, may be the remains of an alien-human hybrid. The Star Child is a skull that was found 60 to 70 years ago. We think we have an example of a hybridization process between an alien and a human. This could be, could be perhaps, the single most amazing and compelling proof that there is a hybridization process being carried out by beings on another planet. He cites other discrepancies in the fossil record. If you look at the skulls and body bones of all of the prehumans. They have sloping foreheads, huge brow ridges, big round night vision eyes, big wide nasal passages, mouths that stick off their face, no chins, heavy robust bones, extraordinarily long arms, all of the above. 
nothing, nothing about that is human. At, suddenly at around 120,000 years ago in the fossil record, 200,000 years ago according to our genes, human beings come on the scene, Cro-Magnon, whatever you care to call us, and we have everything different. That's impossible except through genetic manipulation. Though there is no biological hard evidence to support these controversial theories, even skeptics are hard pressed to explain the rapid advance of early civilization. So while most scientists search for our ancestors in the rocks and soil here on Earth, there are others who look to the stars. Thanks for watching In Search Of. I'm Mitch Pileggi. Good night.